Welcome. We are so excited to have you guys join us. I am Susan Ibarra. I'm the Director of Operations for the Institute for the Advancement of Community Health here at Furman University. Um, and welcome to our first High School Virtual Academy, which is a collaboration between IACH, the Shy Institute, and the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And we could not be more thrilled to have all of you joining us literally from around the world for this first um, academy that we are launching this summer. We, um, just to give you a little bit of background about this, um, we meet as a group, our institutes meet as a group on a regular basis, and we just started thinking about this a few months ago and said, hey, COVID-19 has changed everybody's plans. Um, how can we um, connect with students across the country, across the world, and provide them an opportunity to improve some of their professional skills, get access to some of our uh, faculty and staff that are incredible, as you're going to learn about, and really give a unique experience for many of you who I'm sure your plans for this summer completely changed, right? Maybe you had plans for a job, maybe you had plans for an internship, Maybe you're planning on traveling somewhere um, and all of that changed. And so this became um, a great opportunity for us to really showcase our institutes here at Furman and connect with all of you. And our hope is that um, this is just the beginning of your connection with our institutes, that you will learn more about the work that we're doing at Furman. You are going to grow as an individual over these next two weeks. Um, and develop your own personal brand. You are going to learn about community health, sustainability, innovation, and entrepreneurship. You are going to lead this two week program with skills that will help you in every aspect of your, the rest of your high school career and beyond when you're in college. Now, in all honesty, we hope you choose to come to Furman University. That's our sincere hope that you come to Furman and that we get to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and continue to grow these relationships. Um, but even if you choose to go somewhere else, these skills that you learn in this virtual academy, we feel confident that they will help you in any area that you choose to pursue professionally. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, I want to introduce the other institute directors that are here. Um, and then I will also give a little bit of background about IACH, and then they will give you some background about their institutes as well. So let me introduce Anthony Herrera, who is the executive director for Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and Wes Strips, who is executive director for the Shy Institute for Sustainability. So I'm going to let them give you a welcome and then each of us will give a little bit of background about our institutes um, and talk about what they do and answer any questions that you guys may have. So I'm going to turn it over to Anthony first. Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to Furman University. We are excited to have you here today. This is going to be a transformational two weeks. A lot of exciting things going to go on. Um, and we're going to, we're going to push you, right? We're going to push you to your limits. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to learn a lot of, new skill sets. You can learn about this world. And let me tell you, we all know this, as Susan said, this world has changed. In the old playbook that we've been using on how to get into college, how to succeed in college, how to succeed in this world, that's gone. And so this is an exciting two weeks for us to help you um, adapt to that new world. And so my institute is called Furman Innovation and Entrepreneurship. It's a fairly new institute, the last two years. Um, and we are here to develop innovative and entrepreneurially minded leaders right, to grow an entrepreneurial ecosystem at Furman. So if you come to Furman, you have the resources to take an idea and do something with it, right? No longer is it acceptable just to have an idea and just sit with it, right? Our world now more than ever needs innovators, leaders, right? We need people who are coming up with vaccines to cure this disease. We need people coming up with businesses who are going to deliver our groceries. And so we know this time COVID-19 has affected all of us in dramatic ways. And so our institute now more than ever is so critical. And the third component is we're gonna help contribute to the local and regional entrepreneur ecosystem. And so most of my days, the last 12 weeks, I've been spending with leaders around the state on how we're gonna adapt our leaders here in the state positions and organizations to be more innovative, 
right? Just last week, I was speaking with our city administrator here in Greenville, and we were talking about, hey, so many of the business down our main street, right? Our main street downtown won't be here in about 90 days if we don't do something quickly, right? And we were talking about putting together a boot camp just like this, which you're going to get over these next two weeks for some of our business leaders that are helping our communities. And so we're excited to be here. We're excited to collaborate with the Shy Center as well as IAC. Uh, we got a great team here. I got my team. I think, I mean, there's a lot of you on my screen, but I think my team here, we got Catherine Boda, who, who's going to be with you um, for the next two weeks, um, as well as Nicole Ragsdale. Nicole, give me a shout out there. Um, they're coming here from Furman Innovation Entrepreneurship. You'll also see my managing director, Brian Davis. He'll pop in. Unfortunately, he may have COVID, so we're not sure. So he's out for the next couple of days. But he promised me he'll be back. He's high energy, way more energy than me, and he has way more beautiful hair than I do. So he's going to be here. So really excited. And to turn it over now to the guy with the best hair out of all of us, hey. Wes Drip. No. <laughs> I said guy. I didn't say girl. Guy. So Susan, yeah. You're okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Anthony and Susan. Uh, Anthony, how can you say more high energy than you? You are like the, the king of high energy, I must say. So uh, that's, that's what caffeine will do starting at five. Is that right? <laughs> Double shots of espresso. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, to wherever you are all around the world. Um, I will reiterate exactly what Susan and Anthony said. We are super, super excited um, for you to be with us on this first virtual academy. I mean, this is really an exciting time. Uh, to dovetail off what Anthony said, I mean, this is a, this is a kind of unprecedented time in human history. And, uh, you know, I, all our plans that we had kind of had set out for the, the summer and even in the fall have been kind of turned on end. I'd like to say we see that as an opportunity, uh, as Anthony was alluding to, in terms of um, this becomes an exciting time, particularly from my end around sustainability and that um, we're seeing what happens when all of a sudden the whole system comes crashing down. And so how do we make a more resilient world? How do we respond in a way that is really um, proactive and forward thinking? Um, because as Anthony said, uh, if we don't and just sit around, that things are, are only going to get worse with that capacity. So we have to be kind of uh, exciting. And so we are really, really excited to work with you uh, the next couple of weeks on talking about these issues, thinking about ways for us to uh, come out of this COVID crisis that much stronger kind of on the back end. Um, I am really excited to share those uh, with those in the, the sustainability sector. Um, some of our great faculty that are working in, in these issues around sustainability science in particular. Um, I'm a faculty member as well as a director, so I've been at Furman now for 15 years, hard to believe, but I'm a professor in Earth, Environmental, and Sustainability Sciences, and over the next couple of weeks, uh, you're going to get a chance to meet some of our great faculty that are doing great work in our community around addressing kind of these real-world issues and real-world problems, whether that's issues of social justice and equity, uh, which couldn't be more uh, pertinent right now, given all the, this pivotal time kind of in, in, the, in U.S. history as we address these issues, uh, whether that's issues around food systems and food insecurity that are really being exposed as, you know, people are struggling with unemployment and, and other kind of changes uh, to the, the, the business sector. Uh, and then certainly the issue of climate change has come back around, and we're seeing this issue in, in terms of uh, if we could only mobilize maybe uh, the, the world around climate change as we've seen the world begin to mobilize around COVID, we could really make great strides. So uh, this is an exciting time and uh, we are really, really, really excited that you have decided to join us uh, on this journey uh, and excited to really work with you over the next two weeks on, on talking about some of these really pivotal issues um, and giving you some skills and, and uh, adaptability skills that'll, that'll set you up, I think, quite well for the rest of your high school years. And then when you come join us here at Furman, uh, mm -hmm. whenever that may be. Mm -hmm. So with that, Susan, I'll, I guess I'll turn it back to you and then I can okay. talk more about the Institute depending on what folks want to hear Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, just to give everyone a little bit of background about the Institute for the Advancement of Community Health, which is where I work, um, and also a little bit of background about me. I am a Furman alum from the class of 1992. I um, then worked in healthcare administration, um, practice management, small practices um, in Texas and here in South Carolina before returning to Furman 
um, in the role of a pre-health careers advisor in 2008. And then I moved into the Institute when it was developed in 2016. Um, so our Institute focuses on community health. And a huge part of that focus is something we call social determinants of health. Um, many students that come to Fermi University are planning on some type of career in healthcare. But healthcare and, um, and health in general goes well beyond just the clinical aspect of health. And so our institute, in, uh, especially in research, we focus on social determinants of health, which is basically where you live, you work, you play. Um, what does that setting look like? Is it a healthy setting? Do you have access to healthy food? Do you have access to educational opportunities, access to health care? Um, the research shows that those individuals who don't have access to these things or have less opportunities and resources available to them, then their overall health status is affected by that. And so much of our research in the IECH focuses around that. Um, we currently have several research projects um, going on, one with the Magdalene Clinic here in Greenville. And that, pro, that uh, project is focusing on helping pregnant women who have a history of substance abuse. Um, and addiction. And so providing them a community that allows them to thrive and succeed um, rather than being ostracized from their community. They're pregnant women, they need community, they need more than just clinical care, they need other individuals to connect with, they may need help finding a job, they may need help um, accessing food. And so our research um, with the Magdalene Clinic is a collaboration and if you join us next week if you're part of our our um, cohort for next week you're going to learn about that collaborative care model what does it mean when you have a physician but you also have a community that rallies around an individual to provide them all the resources they need to have the best possible outcome and the best overall health we really want to focus on on health not on treating illness right if we can focus on people being healthy and preventing illness rather than just being focused on treating the sick um, then that really shifts our entire focus of course we have to talk about COVID-19 um, just that has changed everything as you think about the individuals around the world that have been the most affected by COVID-19 um, regardless of which country you're in, I'm sure that you can look at the numbers in your city, in your country, and see that those individuals with less access to care, with less access to testing, or being able to isolate and to quarantine um, and have their food delivered, or not have to go out, or not have to go to work, those are the ones who have better outcomes. So again, this issue of social determinants of health is critical now more than ever. And COVID-19 has really shown us that over these last three months. Um, so we are excited to have you learn about what social determinants of health are, what that means um, for your community, what that means for you as a community member, or if you decide to go into healthcare someday, either as a clinician, as a public health professional, um, as a researcher, epidemiology, public health, any anything like that. Even if you decide to become a city official, what does that mean for you um, if you're in politics and you're looking at the people that you support? How do you make sure that they have access um, to the things that they need so that they can lead a healthy lifestyle? Um, the other huge focus of our institute is around education. We have a Master's of Science in Community Engaged Medicine that our institute manages and um, is in partnership with our graduate school here at Furman. Um, and then undergraduates, so a huge number of students at Furman um, every year come in as freshmen and say, I'm going to medical school. And we applaud that if they want to go to medical school, but we want to be sure that they understand that there are thousands of jobs in healthcare. Um, and my personal passion is making sure that those students are in that career and that profession where they can contribute the most and they are the happiest and really 
um, reaching their full potential. For some students, that does end up being medical school. Um, but one of the reasons I chose to leave the healthcare industry and come back into education was I saw many, many um, physicians who were not happy in their jobs, in their roles, um, for a variety of reasons. Maybe they didn't really understand what they were getting into, or they didn't understand how things would change. And so what we really focus on is helping students understand that there are thousands of jobs in healthcare, and how do you find the one that you um, think is best for you, where your strengths and your expertise and your education can contribute the most towards the healthcare of, of the community that you choose to serve. And that doesn't have to be as a clinician. Again, we'll talk more about that next week um, if you're in, in our cohort for IACH. Mm -hmm. um, I think I will turn it back over to Anthony. Um, if you have any questions specifically about any of the institutes, please feel free to reach out to any of us um, and uh, we will be happy to answer those questions. One more thing I wanna do, I think most of my team is here as well. We have Kate Lewis. Kate, are you here? I think you are. Um, Kate Lewis will be with you for most of the next two weeks as will Megan Probst. Um, I think that's it, that's all we have right now. Um, for those of you that are part of our um, uh, cohort next week, then you will get to meet the rest of our team, including our Director of Education, um, Research, and uh, some of the other members of the team as well, and many of the community partners that we work with. So, um, Anthony, do you wanna share anything else about innovation or Wes, anything specific sure. about sustainability? Yeah, I'll let Anthony, Anthony go first and I'll say a few things at the end. Perfect, yeah, okay. thank you all. Just real quickly, I know, and I think, did they have an orientation yesterday or something? They did, so they you did. guys know about this chat box below. And so I wanna just get your juices flowing because I know it's all early for everybody, unless you're on your third glass of coffee, you're probably fading right about now. So it's really important that we keep you engaged. And so right below, open up that chat box. I just wanna ask everybody here, have you in the last three months, the last 12, you know, 12 weeks, have you seen a problem that needs a solution or have you had a solution, just didn't know what to do with it? Meaning like, do you have an idea of something, whether it's a, how to make something better that you already use, a business, an idea, healthcare. If you just put in the chat book, say me, M-E, me, um, whether you have an idea that you have, you're just thinking, hey, I could do something with this, or two, um, you see a problem, right? Overwhelmingly, you see everybody coming in from Lily, Kara, Elizabeth, Sharon, Andrew, Stefan, great. See, all of us have ideas. And with Susan, and I'm sure Wes is gonna talk about, Firm and Innovation Entrepreneurship, we're here to help you launch those ideas, right? And that's the goal is what you're seeing today is a critical need for innovative leadership, right? And so my background here, I started off, I've been in the corporate world um, with a background in executive coaching, executive leadership development. I've been at two other universities. I've taught at Baylor University as well as SMU University. And most recently, I, was, I led executive leadership development for Toyota, North America. So I'm sure most of you either drive a Toyota, have seen a Toyota on the road. Um, Toyota has been in North America for 60 years. And when I was there, they recruited me over there because they said, if we're gonna be here another 60 years in North America, we have to have innovative leaders, right? They started to think gone are the days that Toyota's competitor is GM, is Ford, is Chrysler. It's now, it's Google, it's Uber. It's Tesla, right? It's these new organizations, organizations that you will be coming up with. And so what their leadership was saying is that we need to develop innovative leaders. And that's what you're gonna get out of this, um, these next two weeks. Um, but that's something specifically, if you focus on firm and innovation and entrepreneurship next week, we're gonna really drill into that. We're gonna show you, how do you take your idea, test it and implement it? Because now more than ever, as we see in this situation, we need people to, to launch innovative ideas, whether it's in our healthcare system, sustainability, business, or even in government. And so I'm excited to be with you. My team here, like I said, Catherine's gonna be with you for the both two weeks, Nicole as well, but you're gonna be joined with our entrepreneur in residence, Brian, several speakers we have in the community. It's gonna be a really exciting time. And we hope that by the end of these two weeks, you all 
we'll be launching ventures that can transform our communities and change our world. So we're really excited to be with you today and I'll turn it over to Wes. No, uh, Anthony, that's a great uh, segue as well, because again, um, I think when people think about the word sustainability, what usually typically comes to mind the most is how do I recycle? Uh, I want to compost. Uh, and those are all important elements. But I think what we really want to show and reflect to you is that sustainability is so much more than that. It is so much more broader than that. It is about issues like not only climate change, but issues of social justice and equity. It's about food security. It's about food systems. It's about poverty. Uh, and so we really hope to kind of broaden your scope. And to Anthony's point, we need you. <laughs> you are this next generation of leaders that will have a much more holistic kind of systems way of thinking. And that's something that we at Furman really strive through, through our institutes and through our programs. I am excited to tell you that we, um, Furman has been at the cutting edge of sustainability. Um, about 10 years ago now, we made the decision to add a major in sustainability science. So you can come to Furman University and get a Bachelor of Science degree in sustainability science. We're one of the only schools in the nation to have it. But again, I think we recognize very early on how important it is to have students that have that really multiple perspectives, multiple way of thinking. Um, and so a lot of the, the work that we focus on is literally bringing folks from multiple disciplines and multiple perspectives together around a table to think about addressing these large scale kind of regional, local, national, global systemic problems. And so we too are about seeking solutions and we're really excited in week two to really take a deep dive and not only look at some of these kind of grand sustainability issues, but think about how can you contribute in your communities? How can you be that solutions uh, driver, that solutions leader that we so desperately need uh, in these days, not only now immediately, but really this is where the world is going. We're no longer gonna be able to solve these problems by taking a very myoptic, narrow view from one very small perspective. We need folks with multiple perspectives. And so your voice is gonna be that much important kind of moving forward. I like Anthony will point out, uh, Hannah Daly is here from my office as well. And you'll be seeing a lot of Hannah. Um, so she'll be with you on and off through this first week. Um, and then in that second week, you're gonna get a chance to meet a bunch of our faculty in that sustainability science program, as well as some of our community leaders that are really doing great work actually in the sustainability field. Couldn't be more excited that you're here, looking forward to, to spending time with my sustainability cohort in week two. Um, but I am just so excited that you have, have decided to join us on this, this journey. Um, we're gonna do great things and I, I, I will, reiterate again what Susan Anthony said, um, this is an exciting time and you are, um, you're gonna come out feeling really good about the skills and stuff that you've acquired here at the end of week two. And we're here to help you uh, achieve those goals and really push you along. We're gonna push you uh, along to really think deeply about some of the stuff and, and, and move forward. So thanks that you're here and thanks to Susan and, and the team for, uh, for organizing. Great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Catherine, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, you all mentioned we're really excited that you guys are here. Um, we know a little bit about you from your applications, um, and we are so glad um, to have such a great group. You all had impressive stories and applications, so thank you for joining us. I wanted to now share with you all what we know about you, and then we'd like to learn a little bit more as well. So to start with, there's 62 of you. You represent eight different countries. So think about that. It's not 9 a.m. for everybody right now. Um, we have people from all over the world, from Japan and Albania and Canada. Um, so you should be excited to get to know people from all over the world these next two weeks. You represent 12 different states in the United States. And then all 62 of you represent three different academic tracks. So Anthony, Susan, and Wes just introduced those. So community health and innovation and sustainability. Um, you all should have received this information that you all are placed in your first choice academic track. Um, so whatever you put on your application, and if you don't have that information, we can share that with you later. Um, but what I want to hear from you now is you get 10 words. I want you to put it in the chat. I want you to share number one, your academic track. So just the name of it. And then 10 words to describe 
Why is that interesting to you? Maybe you know nothing about it and you just want to learn something new. Um, whatever you can fit in 10 words. Go ahead and share that in the chat to everyone and I'll share a few of the responses. Everyone's doing their thinking. They're like, what, what track am I in? <laughs> I was just trying to get here this morning. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a representative from sustainability. That's awesome. Okay. There we go. Here we go. All right, so we have some people for sustainability interested in finding out how it relates to their own communities. Um, we have some folks wanting to study business in college, so want to learn more about innovation and entrepreneurship, um, impacting others. Okay, these are some awesome responses. And I would recommend, you know, during the breaks and during some downtimes, feel free to read through these. You'll have access to them, um, but know your, your classmates a little bit better. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Um, I want to call on a few people and maybe you can expand a little bit more. So maybe Daisy, could you share based on your response? You can turn on your audio and just share with the group why you're interested in, I believe it was innovation. Yeah, because I like using my ideas and kind of transforming them into like ways that people can change the way they live or the way they think about things and use like new methods and just kind of like um, improve the community and stuff like that. So that's kind of what brought me to choose this track. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. I mean, this is the innovative leadership that we were just talking about. These are the people, you're the people that we need to make these changes. Um, let's see um, if I can get a couple more responses. How about Yasmin? You mentioned community health. I'm interested in what you have to say. Yeah, um, I wanted to follow the community health path because I want to become a pediatrician when I'm older and help um, those kids who just need their checkups or basically just to be another person who's helping. Great, thank you for sharing. Well, you're gonna learn a lot from Community Health and from Susan and her team as well. All right, let's see if I can get somebody from sustainability as well. How about William? What are your thoughts? Why sustainability in Greenville? Um, I really want to focus on the super fun sites in Greenville that affect um, different areas like San Susi and Nickeltown because it's in it has a bad effect on people's health and I'd also like to um, learn a vocabulary so that I don't sound ridiculous when I talk about it. That, that's a great reason. Well you're gonna learn a lot of vocabulary. I'm sure you'll have to keep a little dictionary to keep yourself on track. Thank you for sharing that as well. Um, now what I want to do is I'm going to break you out into breakout rooms. So we talked about those yesterday, but you'll get a request on the screen. So Hannah, if you want to break them out into rooms of four or five, that would be great. Um, and what I want you to do is you're going to get to know your, your classmates a little bit better. Um, I want you to share, obviously, your name. So share your name, share the school that you go to and where it is located. And then I want you to share your favorite hobby interesting about yourself. So this should be quick. We'll give you guys maybe two or three minutes to kind of chat um, and then we'll invite you back um, and then we'll have one more thing before we send you off to your first session. All right, so you will see just like in the session uh, last night, whenever I click open all rooms, you'll see uh, a prompt that will take you to your room and you can click on that. And then we'll put the questions in the chat box just to remind you um, what you should be talking about. 
All right, so here we go. All right, and at least one person may not be able to join because they're on. Yes. So hopefully. So Zane, um, I'm going to assign you to room now. And it looks like somebody else just logged in, but maybe they logged up again. Because now they're not showing up. And did John and Lauren both get rooms? They should have. Sometimes they just kind of like hover here. Yeah. Yeah, it says Zane is just not joined yet. Lauren is not joined. Okay. If you're having issues, folks, Zane and Lauren, um, you can either unmute yourself and talk to us or you can put a, a chat. Oh, whoops. No. While you're here too. Oh, it looks like the breakout rooms will close in 20 seconds. I can put. Oh. <laughs> um, can you keep it open? Oh, wow, they're coming Oops. back. We can send them back. Yeah, okay. send them back. We're going to put you all back in, in breakout rooms <laughs> for a little bit longer. You didn't have enough time. Sorry. I automatically will close in two minutes now. There you go. Go back in your breakout room. All right, ready? Room. Yeah. Trial room. <laughs> Trial run into the rooms again. There we go. All right, did everybody get a It's like everyone's bouncing out. Um, Megan, my question for you is I'm gonna take them through Box because I know they have to download a document for Susan. Is the file, um, I'm assuming it's the July 13 Excel database that she. Um, yeah, I'm assuming that's what it is too. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Then I'm going to just like walk them through how to download that. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then Kate. Yeah, I'm looking at. You just texted me, but. Right. I think Kate went to one of the rooms. Okay. Kate went where? To one I think Kate of went to one of the rooms, yeah. Oh. Um, I know Lauren has had trouble with the um, with the strength stuff, but Luce was trying to work on that last night. Um, oh yeah, we'll we'll get her the right code, even if we have to get yeah. a new one. Well, yeah, Luce has been working on it, and I'm not. I don't know. We'll we'll figure it out. The good thing is, is that the students have access to strengths long after they finish right, this, okay. so it's okay. still it's still going to be relevant. So, um, let me just say to all of you guys, like I am super pumped. Like <laughs> I like can't Anthony, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's a great group. I'm excited. You guys, I got to tell you, um, Hannah, Catherine, Megan, Kate, yeah, like everybody that's worked on this. We're good doing job. It. We're doing it. All right. It looks like we have Anna back. Anna, can we answer any questions for you? Um, I don't have any questions, I don't think. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Good. Did you get a room assigned to you? I just want to make sure you didn't get straight. Yeah, yeah I did. We just finished really fast. Perfect. Okay. Right. Great. And there everybody comes back now. In about awesome. 15 seconds, we'll have everybody back in. In five more seconds. I feel like I'm leading a yoga class. Holy <laughs> <laughs> All right, that looks like we have everybody back. Um, you guys will have more time throughout these next two weeks to get to know each other, to work on projects together. We want to stay engaged. I know sitting in front of your computer can be um, quite a task. So keep the chats coming. Um, and we'll keep you engaged as well. So I want to know the most interesting hobby. I want to get to know you guys a little bit better. So I'm going to call on, or actually, yeah, I'm going to call on a couple people and I want you to share either your hobby that you shared or 
the best hobby you heard um, from somebody in your group. So let's see, I'm gonna call on, how about Cora? Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, well, my hobby actually is photography. I like very artsy stuff. I like painting as well. I'm pretty creative. I like trying new things every time. So it's pretty hard to choose just one hobby. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's see, how about Sam He? Would you share? Yeah, so um, my, I like to surf a lot during my free time. So that's like one of my hobbies. But like, well, like playing basketball, I guess. Like sometimes like exercise, I guess. Okay, and are you from somewhere where you can surf a lot? Yeah, I'm from San Diego, so like. All right. Years. Well, I'm personally jealous. That's an awesome hobby. Yeah. All right, let's see. How about Leone? Would you share from your group? Um, yeah, someone in my group, their hobby was playing basketball. Very cool. Got some athletes out here. All right, let's see. How about Stefan? Would you share one from your group? Uh, so a person in my group said that their hobby was uh, working with their business. And uh, they didn't really have a separate hobby, they said, but yeah. A business is probably all consuming. Well, whoever you are out there, I hope to see you next week in innovation and entrepreneurship. Feel free to send us a message and we can chat. Um, well, thank you for sharing those as well. Um, again, we'll keep getting to know each other, but thanks for those. I wanted now before we move into our first session to share with you about Box. So last night you should have received an invite to this Box folder. So this will hold all of the documents that you'll need for this week. If we have something that we're gonna share with you, we will load it onto Box, and notification for it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, but if any of you have not received that invitation, it would have gone to your email um, that you registered for this program with, or if you sent us a changed email, it would have gone there. Um, but if you did not receive that, feel free to message one of us and we'll make sure you get the invite with your new email address. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and I will share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can someone from my team let me know? Can you all see it? Can I get some thumbs up if? Yep, we can see it. Okay, awesome. Okay, so it should look something like this. Now, fair warning, this is a Furman platform. Um, and so you would have seen something that says, I am not part of Furman. You don't have a Furman email address. And you would have had to download Box. Um, so if you had trouble doing that, I will make sure to email you the document. Um, but I will just give you some brief information. So. Your folder would be called the 2020 Furman High School Virtual Academy Student Materials. Um, I'll just walk you through a couple of core pieces that you'll need. But if you go into the welcome folder, for example, this is where you'll find how to add your profile picture on Zoom. It'll help you set up your Box account. Um, you'll have your weekly schedule. Um, you'll have all of our contact information as well. So if you have questions, you have our email addresses. Um, so that's in the welcome folder. And then by each day, if your parents happen to ask you, what did you learn today? Or if you're curious what you're going to learn the next day, um, feel free to click on the folder and you'll see the agenda for each class. So I'm going to go into Monday, July 13. So today you're going to have a strengths session. So that was the test you took last night. You'll be going through that and you'll also kick off with Excel. Um, so it'll say session on it if it's the agenda. So your first session will be called data listening skills with Dr. Susan Donovan. So you would just click on it. You'll see this document. It'll share discussions, questions, key objectives, some information about your professor. And then you can just go in the right hand corner and you can click download. And then you should have access to all of that. You may want to keep box up 
throughout the day in case there's a document a professor needs for you to access. What I want you all to do now is there's a document under Monday that says July 13 Excel database. And someone from my team too just message that in the group and we'll make sure that you all have that. So it's called Excel database, Susan Dunavant. So I'm gonna click on that. And this is a whole bunch of data that you'll be sorting through and you'll click download and you will need that in your first session. So we have a 10 minute break starting at 950. So sometime during those 10 minutes, if you can download that, that would be great. Uh, Catherine, there's been a few people that have chatted about not being able to access Box. So um, I will be sending an email to the folks that have privately messaged me. If you privately messaged anybody else, just go ahead and send a message to me and then I'll send an email out to all the folks that had issues with that within the next um, 10 minutes, okay? And you can just include the file in the email as well and we'll make sure okay. the box folder as well. All right, so we have a couple more minutes before we take a break. Do we have any questions from the group? All right. I'm not hearing anything. Susan, did you have anything else before we um, transition? I have a barking dog. Hold on. <laughs> Does Danny have a question? Danny raised their hand. Yeah, I just wanted to know. I wanted to ask what, what do we have to download? I didn't get that. Sorry. Um, it is called July 13 Excel database. Um, it's yes. under the Monday folder. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It has the name Susan Donovan at the end. That's a professor who will be running the session. Thank you. Well, why, don't why get Susan, scared by all the numbers. Until Susan comes back, I just want to say I am so excited. I'm going to sign off, but I look forward to seeing the sustainability cohort next week uh, where you'll see a whole lot of me. So uh, have an awesome first week and I'll see you all in about a week. And I'm going to go ahead and answer this question that just came up for everybody. So the person said, should I download the spreadsheet? You can go ahead and download it because you'll need to see that information for your next class. So great questions. Oh, maybe that was Sade. Okay, I had one more question that says someone can't access the folder because it requires a Furman ID. Um, make sure you download um and you don't have to be a Furman within the Furman community to to download what we can do for this first session since there's so many folks that are having issues we can just send out this one um, spreadsheet to everybody just in case you have issues with it in the next 10 minutes um, but before the last session let's go ahead and try to get that box account set up um, or if you're still having trouble at least by uh, tomorrow morning There's also one other question that might apply to everybody. If uh, somebody asked if they could do the box stuff with their phone, it would be better to do it with your computer so you can edit things on your computer because you will be learning about Excel and learning about PowerPoint and those things that are difficult to do on your phone. If that's the only option you have, that's better than nothing, but we would encourage you to do it on your computer. And we just had a tip from Isabella, yes. She said you hit not from Furman and it'll let you download. All right, well with that, um, we will start the session exactly at 10 o'clock. Um, so you'll have a professor who will lead Excel and that's a data storytelling class. Um, so you can take a break, shake your legs out, go grab something to drink. Um, but be back a couple minutes early so we can go ahead and get started and feel free to hang around and ask us questions if you're not able to, to download the file. What we encourage you to do, please don't log off of Zoom. Just leave. If you want to go do something, just turn your audio, keep your audio off and turn your video off so you can go move around. 
and then just come back on so we don't have to admit everybody every single time. It goes a lot faster like that. Okay, perfect. All right, so we'll see you all in 10 minutes. And if anybody wants to give me a run. I would like to introduce Susan Donovan. Um, I know her as um, the person who is the most helpful to me whenever I need to know anything about Zoom or technology or training. Um, she is responsible at Furman for ensuring faculty and staff are well equipped um, to do whatever they need to do in the technology realm. Um, I'm not giving her enough credit. Um, I am continually in awe of everything she has done, especially over these past few months, um, as we have had to adapt here at Furman to um, teaching via Zoom, um, synchronous teaching, asynchronous teaching. Um, she has been tireless, and I am so thrilled that you guys get to learn about Excel from her. Uh, because she is truly the expert for us. It's who, that's who I go to when I have problems with Excel. Um, and just to give you an I love Excel. I dream in Excel, I'm pretty sure. So I love Excel. Um, so I am thrilled that you guys get to learn from her. I'm gonna let her share a little bit about um, specifics, her background, what she does here, and then launch into um, the first of two sessions. Um, and if you don't, if this is your first time ever working with Excel, that's okay. Um, just use it as an opportunity to begin to learn. For those of you that have a little bit more experience, um, this may open up more questions for you. So if there's anything that I can share personally about Excel, it is um, something that if you're just now starting to use it, you will use it the rest of your high school, college, and beyond in your career, there are so many applications for it. So Susan, thank you so much for joining us and we are excited to have you um, spend some time with our students. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. You're very welcome. Um, the focus of the session today is not gonna be so much on the nuts and bolts of the words you type or the buttons you punch in Excel, but as you look at data, um, within Excel, the kinds of strategies that you're going to use in order to be able to hear what a data set has to say. Even though it's a, a tough time right now with COVID, we're in an exciting time because businesses and organizations all over the place are moving to data-driven decisions. The hunches or the gut feelings of people about making business or other kinds of decisions, uh, those are gone by the wayside and we're, we're needing to be all of us to become data scientists. I became a data scientist in the dark ages when we had uh, huge machines that we punched out holes in 80 column cards in order to do a data assessment. So uh, things have come a long way. But we're gonna uh, look at an Excel data set today. I asked them uh, what kind of data would you all be most interested in? I spend the summer times a lot working with our summer research students here, and I've been in biology and business and sociology and surveys. And so um, the data set they suggested was this college and universities data set. I'm going to try to speak about what I'm doing as I do it. And if you are more comfortable going ahead and just opening up your data set and, and working along, that's fine. If you'd like to watch, I would just watch. I would uh, suggest that you jot down the keywords because it's all over Google. The keystrokes of what to punch are all over Google on these various functions. Uh, but what I think you can leave here today with is a strategy for looking at a data set and mining that data set so that you can hear what the data has to say. And then tomorrow, we will look at the same data that we've figured out about it today and put together a presentation, some kind of a visualization that would allow us to explain something about that data set to a persona, uh, to, whether it would be to a, a board or whether it would be to a, a group of donors or uh, whatever. So um, I'm gonna, I've already got open on my machine the uh, college and universities data set. 
and I hope you all can uh, see my screen. So as you're going to look at any kind of data, the first thing you really want to do is to uh, set it up, set the data up so that you are able to, to know uh, what you're dealing with. The first thing I do in a data set is to start at the column A1 and then press the end button on my computer and then go down, hit the down arrow. That tells me that there are no completely blank rows. Your data does not, is not conducive to being a good housekeeper. I'm gonna hit the end button again and then go to the right and then up and then back over to A1. What that tells me is that this data set is compact and that I can actually evaluate data because there's no completely blank rows or completely blank columns. You need to avoid the temptation of putting a little blank space after the header or something like that because you're just, um, because you're actually causing the data not to be able to be read. The next thing uh, that you're going to do is to review your data set. And um, there's, a, uh, there's another spreadsheet in your folder called College and Universities Dictionary. And I'm opening that data set now. Any data set that is of import, whether it's for universities or organizations, businesses, all of the data is not going to be obvious in the data set. Uh, a good database always has a lot of metadata associated with it. And you'll see in the, put this down and look this back up here. As I, as I try to get to know this data, I'm looking over in uh, sort of the columns AA and through AK or whatever, and I'm seeing a lot of coded numbers. Well, I don't understand what those mean. As a data scientist, you may get a data set that has, that's, that, that is medical, that is any kind of thing, and you're not, you may not have any idea what it means, but there will be a file or there'll be a worksheet in the file. Uh, there will be somewhere an annotated uh, list that tells you the definitions. In the College and Universities Dictionary, I'm going to scroll down. I highlighted it so I can find it easily. Uh, it's in row 671. One of the things we might want to know about a college and university is the institutional size. And so what this dictionary tells us is if the value is minus one, what that means is it's not reported. Not minus two, not applicable. If it's one under a thousand students and so forth. So every one of those fields that you look at that are some kind of code that is, is really gobbledygook, you need to ensure that if you're gonna be working on some kind of a large data set, that you make sure that you have available to you the data dictionary. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is start working with the data. And you're not ever going to mess with the original data set because when you make a mistake, and you will, I always do, everybody I know always does, we're gonna go down to this college and universities tab at the very bottom of your data set. And with a right click, we can move or copy it. And I'm gonna say that I want to create a copy at the end of my workbook. Move to end and create a copy. And say okay. And that copy is the, the data set that I'm gonna work with because I'm gonna sort things and add data and, and do all kinds of crazy things with it. And that way I can make sure that my original 
is, is preserved. As we get started, the one thing you'll want to do is to set your view so that you always see your headers. And that's pretty simple by going to the view item on your ribbon. And under freeze panes, one of your choices is to freeze the top row. By freezing the top row, even though we have a very long data set, you'll always be able to keep the title in view and you'll know which field you're working with. Believe me, once you get over into these areas where you've just got a bunch of numbers, it's really hard to keep track unless you do something like that. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is uh, we want, we'd like to just look at a couple of different states as we look across here. And the simplest way that I can filter out for uh, states is to simply go up to the data tab on your ribbon. And there's a button under, under the sort and filter group, you're gonna see the word filter. If you click that filter button, you'll notice that little drop down boxes appear at the top of every single one of your fields. So if you are brand new to Excel, you figure it out by now that it's organized in columns and rows and your fields are the same thing as variables. And then each individual row is a record. So we're looking at records here that are from Maryland, New York, New Mexico. I'm going to uh, look for the states of maybe South Carolina and North Carolina. There's a bunch of states represented here. Um, you're free to figure out which state you wanna look at. So um, as I pull down that drop down box for state, I would deselect select all and then just go down and I'm just gonna choose for now, North Carolina and scroll down to South Carolina and say, okay. And you'll notice that the, the numbered rows, the numbers have turned blue and they're no longer sequential because there was a lot of rows that aren't, aren't being shown. There's no longer 1700 records, there's uh, just the records that are, that fit my criteria. And I can go ahead and um, do other things with it. Uh, one, of the, one of the fields here is the NAICS uh, description, and that's the uh, North American Industry Classification System. And you'll see those descriptions used all over the place in business data sets and everything. So maybe as I pull that down, I also just want to see which of the things are actually colleges and universities. So that's one way that we can filter our data to begin to see what kinds of uh, things we have in the, in the data set. To, to get rid of that, all I'm going to do is click filter and it goes away and I'm back to my original data set. Okay, I'm not, Catherine, I'm not watching. If there are questions that, need, that I need to address, would you let me know? Yes, I will let you know. We're just okay. some personal questions of, are they supposed to be working along with you or can they just watch? Um, I had suggested that they, if they feel more comfortable just watching, that they've got the data set and that they would take, make a note of what, just the key words like filter or advanced filter or whatever. And if they're more comfortable, I'm, I'm actually saying what I'm doing when I'm doing it. So if they want, if they're more comfortable working along, they're free to do that. Perfect. Then we will do that. And for everyone's information, you will have a copy of this recording. We'll upload it this afternoon and you'll have access to it this week. Um, if you miss something and wanted to go back. And okay. if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, if you're missing something, we can try to get those answered. Okay. Um, so the, the other uh, 
way that we can filter data is through what is called an advanced filtering system. And with advanced filter, we can actually choose uh, several different uh, varieties of things uh, that has to be done in the same worksheet. So, so we'll uh, move it over, but I'll just show you how that same kind of uh, filter works if you're using advanced. So we're gonna filter by state, and then we'll filter by the NAICS description. Um, we're gonna want that, I'm gonna make a copy of the uh, of cell S2, so I don't have to type colleges, universities, and professional schools. And then um, if we look over to, uh, keep scrolling over to the right, and we'll get, there's a tote enroll field, which is the total enrollment. Maybe I'd like to look at schools that are just South Carolina and North Carolina that are listed as colleges and that have less than 3,000 enrolled. Maybe I'm looking for small schools in those states. You can choose any of these fields and choose uh, any criteria that you want to do. But I've just moved over a little bit to the right of where the actual data uh, live. And I'm simply going to repeat those headers, which was state and then NAICS description and then tote enroll. Those are the three things that are of interest to me. And the across each row, as you set up a criteria for an advanced filter, that means and. So I do want schools that are in South Carolina, and I'm just gonna paste that colleges and universities, well, I thought I was, we'll go back and get it again. Copy that. And for tote and roll, I want to look at uh, schools that are less than 3,000. So if I were a computer programmer, that would be a program saying that it, we're looking for records where the state is South Carolina, where the description is colleges, universities, schools, and where the total is less than 3,000. We can go down on the next line and make an or statement and we'll just do the same thing with North Carolina. All right then. Remember this, uh, if you're gonna use an advanced filter, it needs to be on the same sheet. So I've moved my cursor just down a little bit below my criteria. I'm gonna click on advanced. Instead of filtering the list in place, I'm going to copy my records to another location. It, it looks for the list range of A1, clear over to AQ7151, which is exactly the range that we want to look at. And as we're looking at that, I'll call your attention to the dollar signs before the A and before the 1, and before the AQ and before the 7151. In Excel, when you copy and paste and you work with data, it expects you to move up and down and left and right. And your references to different cells in Excel are going to move along with what you copy and or what your the data that you're working with. But if you preface those with a dollar sign, you can translate that dollar sign absolutely. That dollar sign does not mean money. That means that the data set is in A1, uh, to AQ 7151, and no matter where you copy it, no matter what you do about it, that those, those uh, references are the right ones. So I'm going to click on the little up arrow beside criteria range, and then move over to where my criteria are, and highlight, mine happen to be in AU, three to AW5, 
So I'm highlighting her and the two records that I want. And I can simply then hit enter or return if you happen to be on a Mac. And then we're gonna open up the copy to area and I'm just gonna go down below my criteria range for just a couple cells and hit enter. And then say, okay. Now what I have here is a new list. And this new list you're gonna see is quite a bit shorter than the 7,000 records because these records are now independent of my original database and I can go ahead and look at those uh, as a separate entity if, if, I'm, if I'm doing some kind of evaluation of that. Now that I've got them, I can copy and paste them anywhere or do anything at all that I want to with them. I'm going to um, look now at even uh, if we are going to look at institutional size, one of the things we want to do is probably, instead of us making up our own numbers, we think that this institutional size, these codes, are what, uh, what would tell us the size of the university. And we looked in the, uh, ac the actual metadata, if you search down the metadata for institutional size, you'll see that it gives you those codes. We've already looked, we've already looked at it to kind of review what that is. And I'm going to use a formula that is a, uses an Excel function called VLOOKUP, which is one of the most uh, often used database functions in the whole darn application. The first thing I want to do here is to insert a column right after AJ, right after institutional size. So what I want to do is to articulate the words of institutional size so that I could uh, use that for uh, other calculations and I don't have to rely on translating those silly codes all the time. So I'm going to click my cursor on the, the actual label for AK, which is the, the column to the right of AJ, where I want, this is where I want my new column, and I'm simply going to right click and then choose insert. And that's going to add a column to my database. It's also going to expand the, the database parameters uh, because when you do it that way, it knows that you're expanding it and it'll change the references to meet it. So I'm going to say, um, I'm just going to say size and put an underscore and text. Just call it something. If you are not familiar with functions in Excel, there are over 380 functions that Excel will do with the numbers and with the data you have to use. Some of these are financial, some of them are statistical, some of them are scientific and engineering. But the format of every single Excel function is exactly the same. That is, it begins with an equal sign, and then there is a function name, and then in parentheses, the information that the function needs to know in order to operate is within those parentheses and the pieces of it are separated by commas. As an example, if you were to use the logical formula, uh, the function of if in Excel, it would be equal if, and then in parentheses, you would put what condition you were asking it to evaluate if cell C1 is equal to four. Then you would separate that first, what's called an argument with a comma. And then you would say, okay, what do I put in this cell if it's true? And then a comma. And what do I put in this cell if it's not true? 
and then close your parentheses. In VLOOKUP, there are four arguments. You're going to say, VLOOKUP, what do you want me to look up, comma, where's the table I can look it up from, comma, and once I find it in that table, counting from the left, which column number is my answer in, comma, and then you're gonna follow that with true or false. True means, well, I just need you to kind of get it approximately. False means, nope, you gotta do it just exactly right. So we're gonna populate this with the actual meanings of the, the ones that are the, from the institutional size. Now I cheated and copied these from the, um, from that worksheet. From the data metadata this morning, but I'm going to put it here and leave it up a little bit uh, for you and uh, also I'll verbalize it in case you're making a sheet uh, uh, working on your sheet as we go along. What you want to do is just find a place on your worksheet and column on in, in a cell you're going to put minus one that's the first value of institutional size and then in the column to the right not reported. What that means is minus one is not reported. Minus two is not applicable. One under a thousand, two, a thousand to four hundred or four thousand nine ninety nine. Three would be five thousand to nine thousand nine ninety nine. Four would be ten thousand to nineteen nine ninety nine. And five would be twenty thousand and above. You can abbreviate that any or which way or whatever, uh, just so that you can see how it goes. And I'm going to look at, um, I'm going to make sure I kind of know where to come back to here. I happen to, I, mine happens to start at, at AW95, so I know where I'm coming to, from. All right. Can you very briefly explain what you mean when you say like V88? Just can you show with your mouse just to make sure we're all following along? The column? Yeah, so when you refer to a cell, can you just kind of give an example, just so we can make sure? Okay, sure. Any place you put your cursor in an Excel spreadsheet, the cell, the, the cell is named by the column and the row. And your columns go A through Z, and then AA through uh, AA through AAZ. Um, and, they, and so on and so forth. Always at the upper left of the screen, you will see the cell name where your cursor is if you get lost. So if I, if I simply, uh, uh, I'm, if I type on the word or click on the word longitude, for example, in the header row, that's Q1, meaning that is in column Q, row one. Is that good, Catherine? That's great, thank you. Okay. And I'll have questions if you're not following along with some of this. I know it's a lot of information and a big database right now. Um, feel free to send a message to everybody and we'll try to get those answered. Um, again, this is a database about college information. So what Susan is trying to figure out right now is information about total enrollment and things like that, which is where she's going now. Okay, so we'll go back to uh, the, the first thing that, um, let's see, where were we? Okay, the institutional size, which would, would be the enrollment, um, was coded. In any database you're going to get from a, from a large organization, 
you're going to find that there's codes. And if you're going to work with this as a data scientist, you want to be able to translate those codes. So we're going to use the VLOOKUP function. All functions begin with an equal sign. Then you type the function name. In this case, we're going to use the VLOOKUP function. It's kind of a complicated function to be one of the ones to start with, but it is the one function that you absolutely need to master if you're going to be working with data sets. Okay, so following the equal sign and the function name, I'm going to put the left parenthesis in, and I'm going to click over here to uh, click over in AJ2, because I happen to be in AK2, and I want to look up the number that's in that cell. My next argument is where do I want to look it up from? So I will do a comma. And scroll to find my, where I put it. So you can see that in my data set, I had put the numbers and what they mean in AW and AX. So I will highlight those and do a comma. The next argument that it wants to know is of these, of these places where we're looking, which column is the answer in? Well, counting from the left, the answer is in column two because AW is column one, AX is column two. So we'll say that's column two, separate that argument with a comma, and we're gonna say false because we want it to be absolutely exactly that answer. Okay, so what happened in all of that is that because of the institutional size was five, the text that got translated in the metadata was 20,000 and above. So we wanna be able to copy this to all the rest of them, but the first thing we need to do is be sure that we have dollar signs in our range that we're looking in. And if there's a formula bar right above the labels for your columns. And if you'll put your cursor there and click on that middle part where, it's, where mine says AW95 to AX101, just hit the F4 button and that'll put dollar signs for you to make sure that when you copy your formula, it did now. We'll do it again. AJ2. Oh. I messed up my range. Gotta go over and get my range again. should be back to good there. So your formula should read VLOOKUP, uh, AJ2, and then wherever you put your range with dollar signs, look in the second column and false. And anytime you're gonna copy in a database, there's a little, tiny little square in the bottom right of every cell when it's that cell is selected. And if you'll double click that guy, it'll copy your formula all the way to the bottom of the database. I can't tell you how many students I work with every summer, research students who are copying and pasting one at a time 
And I think, oh no, don't do that. Can you explain that one more time? Can we just reiterate? So if we want to copy just one cell, you would click Control C. If you want to paste one cell, you would click Control V. Right. And can you just explain how you copy and paste for the entire thing? Sure. You're going to, when you, anytime that you have something, if you've got a database, the purpose of what we're talking about today, this, we're not just talking about, we're not talking about Excel, just plain Excel today. I, I'm, I'm hoping to just sort of introduce you to some strategies because I don't know, some of you are gonna be really good at Excel. Some of you are, are gonna be newbies to Excel, but I'm telling you that these functions and things like that are all over, the, all over Google. You don't need me to, to figure out the arguments for a stupid function. But anytime you're gonna copy something, you're just gonna click, double click that little box and it's gonna copy down to the whole end of the database, whatever you've got. I'll just delete some of these values right here because it's gonna think the database ends now where, my, where I start having text. So I've got my VLOOKUP worked out I'm saying AJ2, and the reason I don't want dollar signs on AJ2 is because I do want it, when I copy it, I want it to go down to row three and four and five and six. I don't want to keep copying the, the thing in row two. I want it to move. But when I want it to look in the range for where to find the answer, that range is, is static. And so those cell references have to have dollar signs on them. And then we'll just, after you get the first one and you know it's all right, and you got it all set up, put your cursor right on that little square at the bottom right and double click that sucker in. I've just copied 7,000 records with two, two quite. That's great, that's very helpful. So that might be something to write down for the group is to hover in the corner and to double click and it'll fill the rest of your empty cells. So that's a great tip that Susan just saved you a lot of time. Um, one other thing, Susan, I was hoping that maybe we could find out from everybody if you can message in the chat quickly, if you have heard of or if you have used the count function or the sum function, if you have heard of it, if you'll message a yes, if you have not heard of it, can you message a no? Okay, so it looks like we have quite a mix. Susan, is there a way that you can just go through quickly how to sum all of the colleges that are in this database, just in case we have some folks who need an easy function? Well, we wouldn't want to sum them. Oh, you can count them? I'm well, sorry. Let's use a pivot table to count them. I mean, that's what we would use in a, in a, in a database. Um, if there's, a, if there's not a pivot table created, maybe we can just show the basic function um, since I think it looks like a lot of people haven't heard of the count if and the sum if function. Um, okay, can I do that first thing tomorrow? Sure. Because I, I think time wise. Sure, of you, course. If, if so for all of you who said you hadn't heard of those, we will do some of those those simple functions so that you'll get some reference tomorrow. We'll start tomorrow with a few simple functions that are just that that just look at, at counting and uh, adding and, and those kind of things. Some of the things are um, some of the things are pretty slam dunk and some of them uh, even the count and count if you can count records if they meet a certain criteria or, or those kinds of uh, those kinds of things. There's a lots of things you can do. Um, I'd rather think about what would something that might be meaningful to to be able to to do that. We're gonna um, the the uh, the one thing I I did want to mention to you. If you are already an Excel aficionado, there is another database and it has its own dictionary in your uh, in the f set of files that I gave you. VLOOKUP can look up across workbooks. And only if you are an Excel guru 
and you've been completely bored to this point, um, you might want to sometime this evening, if you get a chance, you can find, if you're looking at colleges, you might want to know the Dun and Bradstreet number of the college so you can look up the business health of a college. And the Dun and Bradstreet number is in the other database that's in your, that's in your folder. So you could do a VLOOKUP in that database because there is a, there's a number that matches. Anytime you've got a number or a, or a value that matches between two databases, you can use one database to look up something from another. And the iPads or the, the integrated post-secondary education system, which is the sort of the, the national system that keeps track of colleges, the iPads number is in both of those databases. And so you can match records by that and look up the Dun & Bradstreet number if you are a guru and if you are so inclined. But we're gonna do a pivot table and then a, uh, a quick poll. And then I'd like to do, um, I'd like to just show you a little bit, a uh, little bit of something um, about um, about dates uh, before we um, before we get uh, before we get done today, and then tomorrow we're gonna if if you'll if you'll take just a little time and kind of just get to know this database about colleges and universities, uh, we'll figure out a way to do a couple meaningful visualizations to show what the data says uh, about it. Um, but the one thing we're going to do right now is a pivot table. We've already got uh, a pivot table is simply something that counts some things. Oh, and, and it'll add them up too, but it's, it's not a, a exactly a function. But what we're going to look at is this institutional, uh, the size text that we have just done, we'd like, to, we'd like to sort of see how many are these different ones and this way that we can actually interpret them. So in order to make a pivot table, you're going to just put your cursor and click just once anywhere in the data set. You can't be over in these other little uh, extras that we, we did. Um, if you'll just click in the database somewhere and then from your insert menu on the ribbon and in some of the Mac versions pivot table is actually on the ribbon. Uh, but uh, the newer Mac version, it's the same as the uh, as the PC and if you use your insert tab and say pivot table. It's going to ask you to select a table or a range and it guessed correctly. It always does if you have a, a data set with no columns, no hidden columns or rows. And we're gonna choose to put that in a new worksheet. So I'll just say okay. Now what this pivot table does is it allows us to make something that kind of looks like a mini spreadsheet without of a spreadsheet. But it allows us to count things as we go. Over on the right hand side, you're going to build your spreadsheet. You have rows of a spreadsheet. You have columns. And then we're going to put values uh, that would actually count things. So I want to, I'm going to select the state value up from my field list of fields and drag that down to rows. And then you'll see over on the left, it's starting to list all of the states that are in the database. I know that there is a value in every single object ID, so I'm going to let it count that. But it looks like it's actually wanting to sum the object ID, and that wasn't the idea. The idea uh, was to just count how many there are, not to add up the numbers, because the, the ID numbers are sort of irrelevant. So I'm going to click on that down arrow there and go to the value field settings and change some to count. Now we're seeing how many colleges are in each of the states. And if we go back, uh, if we want to go back to our institutional size that we just 
fixed up so that we could use it. I'm gonna use the size text one and put that in my columns. And so now we get a nice picture of how many colleges in each one of the states there are that meet, uh, that meet those different criteria. But I, again, just wanna look at South Carolina and North Carolina. So where it says row labels here, I can pull that little down arrow down, unselect, select all, just like we did when we were doing an original filter. And choose just a couple of states. And then for the column labels, I don't want to look at those big uh, colleges or the colleges that uh, didn't report. So I'll just pull the column labels down and choose the 1000 to 4999. And that gives us an actual number of those. If these colleges are something we would like to actually look at, maybe I wanna see the uh, ones in North Carolina. By double clicking a number in a pivot table, it'll make you a whole new spreadsheet with just those values of the fields. And then you can use that for whatever, whatever your next purpose is for working with your database. Catherine, can we do that poll? Yeah, sure. Um, so you guys have learned a lot today. This is a lot of information. Like Susan said, the world is becoming, we need to become data scientists. So these are some advanced things that will be very helpful later on, but um, we will keep answering questions. I know again, it was a lot of information. I'm going to send you a little quiz um, and you'll just respond to it. No one else will see your answers and then we will so you can respond on your computer. So is anybody voting? I think people are thinking and <laughs> I will see the responses come through. And again, this is not for a grade, so do your best to remember what we talked about um, and click an answer for each. And Susan, instead of uh, moving right into a, um, a visualization, we'll do count some and then we'll work on the dates tomorrow. How about that? I think that sounds great. It looks like we have quite a mix of folks who have maybe not even used Excel before. So. Our, our, our freshmen incoming are, are like that usually. I mean, when, um, when uh, the several of the classes really require some pretty high level uh, Excel skills pretty early on, but, um, and, and you know, we do, uh, IT does training for them uh, that we have several basic things where we just really start from, from scratch. Uh, the perspective of this, uh, since I knew that there would be such a range would be to try to just get an overall kind of picture of how you would the things that you need to do if you're actually working with a database. Right. That was right. what I thought your objective was. Um, but you have to, you do have to have the basics in order to be able to do that as well. It looks like we're getting a lot of answers in. So we will publish it in just a minute. So if you haven't given your response, we have one more minute. So let's see those come through. And if you have any questions that if there's specific things that you would like to see other than count and sum, uh, I do want to share with 
uh, uh, because Excel does some really crazy things the way it handles dates. Um, I'd like to share uh, managing some date issues uh, with you tomorrow and then maybe making a, a really cool chart about one of the whatever one variable uh, you might decide that you'd like to work with tomorrow. So, but if you have questions and, and the, the uh, hosts of this event can get them to me tonight, I'll be prepared to answer them for you in the morning. That would be great. All right, well, I'm gonna close out this poll. So if you haven't responded, you may not get to. So we're at 88%. I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, we'll just, um, Let's oh, just review, the, review it, and that is that your first job when you uh, work, when you're working with a data set is to review the metadata. Good job, 59% of you. You've got to know what the data means in order to make sense of it. When entering a function, you always start with an equal sign. Wow, 80% of yeah, you got great. that one. To use an advanced filter, you have, uh, you have to define it on the same sheet and you do place or criteria on separate rows. Um, I can't see, oh, I guess if I, I guess I can use, okay. over Over half got that one right too. That's good. And when, when using Excel functions, the arguments are separated by commas. Great job. Well, so far the majority's gotten every one of them. You guys were tracking. If the final argument is false, it means that an exact match is required. And when defining ranges, dollar signs refer to the absolute position. And to create a data subset, you're going to double click the number or the value of the subset you want. And that is really terribly confusing because most I will tell you that most people want to double click the header row of it that they don't. Uh, so you all answered the way most people answer, but it just doesn't happen to be the way to do it. But thank you for your time today and we'll talk more tomorrow. Thank you so much. Um, so like Susan said, if you guys have other questions, feel free to message them and we'll make sure we get those answered early tomorrow. All right, well, it looks like you guys have another little break. Go to the bathroom, grab another cup of coffee. Maybe it's snack time, but we'll see you back in about seven or eight minutes. It looks like everyone is back. I don't know if everyone is on video, but I think, I think most of us are here. So if you wanna introduce yourself and the session and we can go ahead and get started. Okay, awesome. Perfect. I'm going to shrink you guys back out because I had everyone on the screen. So, hey everyone, I'm Liz Ruiz. You should have gotten a couple of emails from me over the weekend, and now you get to put a name with a face. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be leading your Clifton Strengths um, for individuals and teams for that, this session today, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about that online assessment you were asked to take, the quote unquote personality test, and what that means to you, how it's going to help you. Um, work with others in projects, teams, clubs, or organizations. It really does apply to a wide range of things. And it's a tool that is used for both for personal development and professional development. So you get a little bit of both. You'll get growth somewhere. Um, and so hopefully you'll be able to take some sort of thing of value for you. So hopefully you'll find the session interesting. And I'm going to give you pretty much the basics. It's not meant to be a full-on um, in-depth session just because it takes so many more um, reiterations for this tool, but I sent you all a background and history to kind of give you a little gist of what the tool is all about and really to cut off um, a little bit of the fluff, fluff that I think is important and relevant. Um, I don't want to waste anyone's time, so I'm going to go straight to the point. If you have any questions throughout the session, please um, drop them in the little chat box. Kate or someone else will help me monitor um, the questions and we will have some time at the end of the session. If you're still confused about anything, want a little bit more explanation and then you'll be able to get my contact info at the end. But we're gonna go ahead and get started. So I asked y'all to have, oh, let's go. 
Oh, before we begin, yeah, a little bit about me. Who am I? Um, I graduated from Furman University this past May. I majored in business administration, and I was involved in a lot of different things at Furman, but probably the most um, important thing that I was a part of was studying abroad. So in the future, and when you guys go off and get to explore the world, if you have an opportunity to live somewhere else or study abroad, take full advantage of it. I was in Brussels, Belgium, absolutely loved it. Sounds pretty cliche. Life changing, transformative, grew so much as a person, also true. Um, that's a picture of me in Dublin, um, in Ireland. And so I have a professional one and a fun personal one, so y'all can get to know me. Um, I was involved with the Shucker Center for Leadership Development all four years. That's really when I first got introduced to the tool. I heard about it in high school, thought it was a pretty cool personality test, but it wasn't until I got to Furman and was a part of the Shucker Leadership Institute that I realized this is so much more than that. It's more complex. There's a lot of layers to it. And through them this past year, I got certified to be a um, Cl Clifton Strengths coach. And I was the intern my senior year, developed a lot of programs, curriculum for students, and I have a lot of experience facilitating workshops and things like that. So that's a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I asked y'all to um, look at that background and info sheet on Clifton Strengths. So we're going to take like a quick little kahoot. Hopefully it works. I know Kate is probably going to drop the link somewhere but I think I have it pulled up somewhere else. Give me just one second. Be here. Okay, so that should be your game pin that you put in on your tablet, phone, et cetera. Uh, Luce, your screen is frozen, at least for me it is. I don't, I think something happened. Yeah, everyone can't see it. What about There we go. There we go. Perfect. Now we can see it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Give you about five more seconds and we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Gotta keep it moving, you guys. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. So, who is the founder creator of the assessment? So, AK, the father of strength psychology. I'll put a little bit of music to add some. Awesome. Hey, awesome. Way to go. Owen, good job. How many domains are there? Awesome. Elizabeth, okay. Way to go. Talent. 
I made the little descri different descriptions in the presentation. Uh, it's very easy to get it confused with either strength, because it is, we're talking, we're throwing around that word a lot, but I'll be able to tell you in the presentation a little bit more why a talent is a talent and a strength is a strength. Mm, changing it up, awesome. Awesome, a lot of you got that one right. One in 33 million. So it's not impossible, it's just highly unlikely that you'll have, you'll meet someone with the same top five in the same order as you. So again, pretty unique. True, it measures the presence of talent, that natural ability for you to be able to do something, mm -hmm. talent. Awesome, way to go. There you go, so that's the strength. So talent, be natural ability to do something, repeating pattern of behavior, um, but then that strength is being able to apply that talent into a situation and be able to provide really good results, um, that near perfect performance in a specific task. That's what makes it a strength. That's kind of more the you being able to leverage that. Um, and I'll give you some more examples of how that, what that looks like. Way to go. Awesome. You guys are on a roll. <laughs> Thirty-four, yes. Yeah. So there's thirty-four um, talent themes, the words that are included in your top five, and then four domains. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what the difference is. So false that is not the popular strengths philosophy that individuals should be well-rounded. That is kind of the philosophy that's been thrown around in our culture. Nothing wrong with trying to be well-rounded, but you'll be able to get more and gain more because realistically, you're not gonna be good at everything. There's gonna be other things that you're gonna require other people for. So strengths philosophy really focuses on, okay, what it is that you're good at, can let's try to figure out where you can help others, where others can help you and really kind of form a partnership and a team culture around it. So it's not necessarily you carrying all the weight, it's you utilizing your network and other people around you to achieve that. So that's more the strengths philosophy. So Gallup's research on high achievers, select all that apply that are true. Oh, one got cut off, this blue one, sorry, everyone. Okay, so all of them are technically correct. So if you at least hit one, you got part of the answer correct. Um, but yeah, so all of this is in the PowerPoint as well, but everything is tied into high achievers and something that Gallup spent some time analyzing is that a lot of people who are those high achievers do spend a lot of their time focusing on their strengths, figuring out um, how they can apply it to different situations to overcome obstacles, but then realize to what degree they need to delegate things and seek out help and find a partner to help them tackle that situation or problem. And then in any situation that they're in, okay, how are my top five gonna help me in this situation? Awesome, way to go. Last question and then we're done. Okay, 
think a lot of you got that one right. Rooted in positive psychology and neuroscience. Not necessarily a tool to identify your weaknesses. We're working on strengths, so what you're naturally good at. Um, necessarily not, we're, we're not going to worry about weaknesses just because there's no point in you trying to, you know, focus on the weaknesses when you can, again, rely on others to help you navigate other things that you might not be great at, but really just focusing again on what you are good at. That comes in that positive psychology and neuroscience. So who is our winner? Third place. Congratulations, nine out of 10. 10 out of 10, awesome, way to go. And our first place winner, way to go, awesome. So to our first place winner, if you could do me a huge favor and drop in your email address in the chat, you have won a 45 minute one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me um, for doing the background work and putting in that extra time and effort. Um, I feel like you should be rewarded. So just put your email address in the chat. That way I can contact you and I can set up a time to do that one-on-one -on -one session with you. So awesome. Thank you. I'm going to try to, can everyone see my power? Group? Nope. Mm -mm. Nope. It's frozen again. Okay. Let's try this again. <coughs> Yep. Okay. Perfect. There we go. Awesome. So hopefully yep. that was a nice little recap for all of you um, about the tool, the assessment, the background. So essentially people who focus on using their strengths maximize their potential. And it, that really is meant to drive in and kind of give you the emphasis on why this tool is so important. Um, people who learn to use their strengths in every day increase their productivity by 7.8%. And I know that might not seem like a lot, but think about how many tasks you do throughout the day, how many choices you have to make. So 7.8% adds up pretty quickly throughout your day. Um, and you guys are all learning this now as um, younger students. And so you have hopefully four years of college ahead of you, or you're going to start to work. And so that's really going to build up over time. To put it in more of a, a business context for you, teams who receive strengths feedback have an 8.9 greater profitability. And that's profit. That's cold, hard money that's going to go to the bottom line and not necessarily just the revenues. And if you're managing a million dollar company, 8.9% profits, it's not just um, like petty cash. So again, has really great impact for those people involved who are utilizing their strengths. So a little bit more about what it is that I want you guys to get out of it, purpose and outcomes. Number one, essentially just understanding your top five, understanding those five words that right now may not have a lot of meaning for you, but hopefully after this session, you'll be able to understand them a little bit more, be able to um, appreciate what it is that you're naturally good at. And then number two, go beyond yourself. Basically, when you're gonna start working on your capstone project, you're gonna be working with other individuals and hopefully this is gonna allow you to go beyond yourself and see, okay, what does my, bring, my team bring to the table? What do we have? What do we have to work with? Three, enhancing that team experience just because it's gonna be a little bit more meaningful because you'll be able to appreciate and validate what others' um, strengths or talents are in your group and then you'll be able to leverage them and use them in your capstone project to overall improve the dynamic and the function of the team. Number four, very important. Um, people get really excited about this one. Being able to properly articulate your skills and what you're naturally good at. I think that sometimes now in, in our culture, we don't really know how to talk about the things that we do very well or we get very shy. We're not very confident about um, talking about ourselves. And it's not necessarily bragging or boasting like, oh, I'm really good at this, but it's more um, being able to say, I'm confident in my ability to do this. This is why you should hire me for this. This is why I'd be great for this position. And so you're going to utilize strengths language, hopefully in the future with um, your resumes, your LinkedIn, your profiles, interviews, and really my challenge for you all is to take this virtual academy experience and say, okay, how did I react? What was I doing based on my top five? And how can I create a story around this experience that I can later um, 
include part of it in my resume, be able to talk to other people in interviews and things like that. And I know Dr. Yubara is going to have a session with you all on resumes. She knows a little bit more about um, strengths content too. So she'll be a great um, resource for you all when you're working on those resumes. Okay, so I asked you all to have your signature themes report kind of handy in a little tab. And so if you have it, great. If you know your top five, um, try to log into your account to pull in, or you already maybe have already downloaded it, but have your signature themes report out for you. And I think Kate will put you all in breakout rooms. What I want you to do is to take a couple of minutes to review your report or make notes of anything that surprised you, that resonated with you, and start talking about that with other people in your breakout room. Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and put everyone into their rooms. Um, and think about the future. That is one of my top five. I realized I didn't tell you guys what mine were. Number one is woo, winning others over. Very easy for me to break the ice, get to meet people, a stranger. I don't really know strangers. They're just friends I haven't really met yet. And I think that's straight from Gallup. So that's where I got it from. Number two, responsibility or restorative. I get those two confused because they're right next to each other. But restorative, being able to fix problems, I like being able to um, just fix them, find better ways to do them, things like that. Responsibility, I have a big, um, a big a commitment within myself to follow through. And if I tell someone that I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Otherwise, I feel really guilty and I just don't like feeling that way. Um, fourth, futuristic, I like thinking ahead and being able to just visualize the possibilities of the future. It excites me and it gets me energized. And then finally, positivity. So I'm a very positive person. Try to look at the glass half full and, and really try to use that positivity with my friends, my coworkers, just to kind of, you know, get people excited. So all of these work together. Not all of them are going to stand alone. And so I want you to make sure that in this initial exercise, you're understanding a little bit more about what each of them mean. Um, and then hopefully in the future, when we're going to do another activity, you're going to see, okay, how are these two working together? And how are all three of them working together? Okay, how are five working together in a situation? So we're going to keep going with our presentation. So good job. Thank you to those of you who shared. I really appreciate it. Um, let's keep going. So so language to remember, again, I think I quoted straight from Gallup, the strangers I've never met um, portion. And so this is gonna be really great for, again, that session that you have in the future with Dr. Ybarra on resumes um, and then conducting, when you're interviewing for a job position, being able to use the language, not necessarily just say like, hi, I'm loose and I'm woo, like I'm great at woo, like that's what I do. Like woo, what, what does that mean? That means nothing. Like changing that language so that way, you're able to properly talk about what you're naturally good at, what those natural um, gifts are, um, and, and use that to your advantage. And then also for your online profiles, LinkedIn, networking. Again, this is all going to be able to help you grow as an individual, but also as a professional. Um, and so I really want to make sure that you guys are all keeping this language in mind when you're creating that story on Virtual Academy, that experience that you're going through right now, these next um, couple of days or two weeks. So make sure you're using that and pairing it up with your um, strengths language in your profile. So a lot of you have asked me um, what the colors meant. And so hopefully I'll be able to answer that through these next couple of slides. So your talents create a filter and essentially it's how you make things happen. And so that's in our purple, how you influence others. That's in our yellow how you build relationships and nurture those relationships in blue, and then how you absorb, think, and process information. And those are our three, or I mean, sorry, four different colors. These are our domains. And this is how they all fall within the 34 in each of the domains. So executing people with this color, um, are the people that help you turn ideas into reality. They're the ones that can easily make things happen and they have a way and a system that works for them to achieve and get things done. The, the people with influencing are the ones that typically help you take charge, speak up and make sure that others are heard. They're very good at voicing other people's concerns and being able to help you in that, in that way. 
the ones in blue are our relationship building, which that, that means that the people with this blue talent are able to hold a team together. They're the ones that maybe are able to read a room and say, oh, okay, like, I'm not sure if, for example, Cynthia, like, is comfortable with us making this decision, et cetera. They are the ones that are more people oriented, which is really cool. Um, strategic thinking are in red and they're the ones that help you make decisions and create better outcomes. They're the ones that are internally processing and a million things are going through their mind. They might not be as vocal about it as someone with influencing perhaps, but they are the ones that are thinking about plan plans outcomes like what do we do if we do this this and that so it's a lot of internal things going on up in the up in the noggin um a really good thing to know about this like i said previously it doesn't matter if you have all purple or if you have all yellow blue or red um you can still achieve the same outcomes that someone with purple or yellow or whatever color um, could still do. For example, I have discipline and consistency, my number 34 and 33. So for me, for example, if I want to go to the gym, and that's one of my goals, is to be able to go to the gym more frequently and get that exercise in for the day, I have to rely on some other strengths to be able to do that. For example, restorative. I realized that, you know, doing group classes or other ways that I was trying to get myself to work out weren't working. Restorative is good at fixing problems, identifying them, and trying to figure out another solution. And so I realized that my old workout habits weren't working. And so then I paired it with responsibility and that sense of ownership and commitment to something else, something bigger than myself. And so with my roommate, I said, hey, I need an accountability partner. Like, let's go work out. She said, great. She said, when do you want to go? I said, 6 a.m. And she said, what? 6 a.m. And she was like, cool, let's go. And so at that point, I can't necessarily um, say no if I wake up. If it's just me, I'll go back to bed and not do anything for the day. But I have that sense of ownership that I gave someone else my word that I'm going to get up at six in the morning and go work out. And so responsibility now is fueling me to get the outcome that some of the other talents could easily be able to do. It takes me a little bit more. I have to do a little bit of of a different strategy, but I can still receive that outcome. So that's a good example of showing you how other things are working together to achieve that goal. So it doesn't matter if you, again, have one of the same color or you have three here and three there, you don't have to have all the colors of that list. Alrighty, thinking forward. So I think Kate's gonna put you all in pairs now. So you're gonna compare what you bring to the table, your top five, and then the top five of another person. I'm going to put a image or share an image with you all um, in the chat box, and it's going to have some questions, and I want you to talk about a previous partnership. Think about someone that you've partnered with in the past, why it's worked really well, um, and the qualities that were in that partnership, but then also Think about your partner, the one that's in that um, breakout room with you. Compare top fives and say, okay, like I have these, you have these. How can these work together? How can these talents work together? And what can we do well? What might cause a little bit of, you know, working out and things like that. So I think, Kate, whenever you're ready, if you want to put them in pairs or groups of three, depending on how the groups yep. work out. All righty, give me one second. Alrighty. All right. Oh yeah, they're all coming back. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna kind of ask the same thing about what kind of what we did with the last activity. Sorry, losing my train of thought. If I could get a couple people to share what you and your partner talked about, what you and your group of three talked about, kind of one strength, um, of your or one talent um, of yours and then another talent of another person. Again, strength will come with productively applying your talents in different situations. That's how you get to a strength. So right now you're all learning about your talents. Later on down the road, they'll turn into strengths. So can I get Jacob up? Jacob, what did you and your team or your partner talked about? So we talked about how all of our traits sort of fell into the same categories and how we're all very much like people pleaser type people 
or what like, kind of people? Like people pleaser type people. Who want to, like we always like try to aim to make people happy because that's what makes us happy. Mm -hmm. I guess so I, I think I think that sort of puts us. That's like a good thing and a bad thing because a lot of times we don't like to take charge and we like to be given instructions, like being told what to do, and that can sort of put us at a loss because we don't have leader. But then if we look at some of the like lower down traits, like in the bottom five, there are some traits that show that when in times of need we can adapt. Like one of my traits was adaptability, and so like if I need to take charge, I'm able to. So mm -hmm. I think that also can help in like the cohesiveness of the team. Yeah, I definitely agree with that for sure. Did a lot of people in your group have, I guess, blue relationship building? Yeah, it was definitely a lot more relationship building and yeah, a lot of- mm -hmm. and, that, and that is good to know about yourself because that way you can hopefully recruit other people, lean in with, um, or, you know, partner up with other people who can help you um, voice your opinion and say, hey, I need to, yeah, I want to please everyone and keep the harmony and I want to, and I get what other people are saying, but I also, so at the end of the day, we need to make decisions or we need to go this way, we need to do that way. So that's, that's good to know about yourself too. Yeah, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, um, what about Walker, what did you and your team talk about or your partner? Uh, we, we made the common connection that all of us have started a business. Oh, that's awesome. So that was, that was really interesting. Thing. And we were kind of talking about the different ways that we had all done it and uh, like different, we were like, how do you, how do you do your advertising and stuff? And so it was kind of a good sharing of knowledge, I guess. Um, is there a particular um, talent that you lean to a little bit more as the entrepreneur that you are saying, oh, I definitely see how I'm using that? Uh, as myself or as a group? Um, I do both. As yourself, one that definitely speaks to you the most, but then something that you noticed with your team? I definitely, I think communication is probably, uh, that actually is probably for both myself and my team, I think, because that's that's really big on kind of getting customers. You really need to know how to communicate with them. Other individuals, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. Lily Grace, you'll be our last one. What did you and your team talk about? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, we all had very different kind of strengths. Um, one of mine was um, ideation. So I love talking about ideas and I love like hearing everyone else's ideas. And I have a lot of ideas myself. So I feel like that's one of the biggest strengths in a group is like being able to hear other ideas and build upon it. And then someone else's strength in my group was competition, which I definitely think is great. I don't have that strength myself, but I feel like it's great in a team and in a group when like you're working against other people, like, you know, hey, because um, you want that competitive strive when you're like uh, working kind of with other people. It's like, hey, this is a great idea, but I feel like this is the best one for our group to be able to like win in like a competition or like be the best that your group can be. Yeah, no, for sure. I agree with that 100%. And the way you described it beautifully, that you're already learning to appreciate and validate other people's strengths and what they bring to the table and how you're able to use that um, in your own work as well. So awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. We're about done. So I'm going to share this last couple of things with you. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes. Awesome. So yeah, you guys all talk about how you do things differently, best ways to collaborate, which is awesome. Please remember to use that and have a conversation with your team. Once you get into those capstone project teams, it'll make the team dynamic go by a lot better, work a lot smoother, and it's great. Again, revisiting the purposes and outcomes. Hopefully you have a better understanding of your top five profile, what those top five mean to you and how you're able to use them. Two, go beyond yourself. Look at the domains and how it's okay if you don't, if you have all yellow, you can still do the same things that the other colors can do and the other talents can do. You're just going to do it a little differently. Three, enhancing that team experience. Again, appreciating and validating um, other people and what they bring to the table, which is what you guys did. That was a little small crash course. And then in the future, four, being able to pay attention to how you're going to be reacting in this situation, the next um, 
couple of days and make sure you craft that story with Virtual Academy and what this experience is like with your environment, what you're doing, the people you're meeting to really be able to, to craft that story very nicely. Here's my contact information. I'd love to chat if you have any more questions or um, comments, things that you wanna share, feedback on, on this. So I'm happy to chat with you guys at any point. Um, LinkedIn, if you wanna go ahead and get out there. I was late into the LinkedIn game. So I'm encouraging you all to go out and develop your LinkedIn's to, to network. And that's it. That's all I have for you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luz. We really appreciate it. That was fantastic. No problem. Happy to help. Have so much fun, everyone. Absorb all the knowledge and everything that has everyone has to say and ask questions. I hope everyone has a good day. I think you guys have a break now, right? Uh, we're going to do a quick debrief, guys, and then give you a quick break before our optional lunch and learn. So yeah, if everybody will stick around for a few minutes here. Thanks, Luz. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> All right. So everybody give me a thumbs up if that was a session you enjoyed and you feel like you were walking away learning something that you didn't know about yourself before. Um, I hope so. I love strengths. Um, my top five are developer, individualization, connectedness, relator, and learner. So I, I tried to pop it in the chat box there that um, almost uh, four out of my five are in relationship building, which um, anybody who knows me a little bit, that doesn't surprise them at all. Um, I actually have all 34 of mine because I'm a strengths coach on the, on the Furman campus. Um, and I love one of you shared that adaptability is in your top. Um, adaptability is number 34 for me. That doesn't mean I can't adapt. It just means I do it a little bit more creatively. Um, so that is really interesting stuff. The more you learn about it, um, I think you'll find it to be a really useful tool. And for the student that won the 45 minute session with Luce, I think it was Shukrain, wasn't it, that won that session? So definitely take advantage of that because um, she can really help you a lot kind of further um, your understanding of that and kind of help you set some personal goals as well. Um, and if you come to Furman as a student, this is something Furman utilizes across our campus. So you'll hear lots more about it then as well. So a uh, couple things I want to go over um, and then we have um, a survey that we would like for you to fill out. We're going to do this each day. Um, Megan, I don't know, do you want to send that and then I'll keep talking or how do you want to do that? Yep, so I'm going to send you guys the link in our group chat. So you just click on that. It's a quick three questions. Should it only take you about a minute to do? And can we'll they still hear me while they're, can they hear me while they're doing that? They should be able yeah. to because it'll pull them into a different. Um, okay, so I'm gonna keep talking while you guys are doing that, but please take a couple minutes to go ahead and do that. Um, so first, what I want to mention, I said this earlier, and I don't think everyone was on um, at that point, but let's talk about Excel. That was super advanced, um, which I think we talked about this in the opening session. Anthony, Wes, and I all mentioned that we were going to push you. I guess we probably should have warned you that we were going to push you at the first session and we were going to really challenge you. I know that a lot of you do not have any experience with Excel. That's okay. Um, you just walked away with at least a little glimpse of Excel that you didn't have before. Um, so please take the time to go back and look at the recording. Um, we're going to make that available later today and tomorrow we've asked um, Dr. Donovan to come in and focus on some of the more um, basic language around Excel and spreadsheets. Um, it is a tool that you will use no matter where you go to college. Um, and if you walked away with one little tidbit of information that you didn't have before, that's huge. And what I saw in all of the, um, in all of the responses was that many of you did, were able to follow along. Um, Megan is going to create a smaller um, data set. Um, than the one that is in um, the box right now that's all the colleges. She's gonna um, just have a smaller data set and I encourage you throughout the week 
um, just go in there and play around with it because you have all of us as a resource for the next two weeks. So um, take the time to go in, play around with it, and you're gonna have questions and come back. If we don't have the answers, we can get the answers from someone within Furman, um, and that resource is certainly there. So take the time to, um, to go through everything, okay? Um, we want this to be helpful for you. I hope the session with Luce was a little bit more interactive um, and, and kind of helpful. I know um, we've tried to really structure things that way, that you're gonna have some of the course content that's gonna be really heavy, um, and then you're gonna have like a professional development piece after that. So we really want to balance that and keep you engaged. Please, please, please take the time to fill out the survey each day. This is the first time we're doing virtual academy. It won't be the last time and we want to do other versions of this. And so we need you guys. We need you to give us that feedback so that we know what works and what maybe isn't working. So please share that with us. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, kudos to all of you. I am so impressed already at how engaged everyone is. Um, different time zones, different places, uh, different backgrounds, and you've already been engaged. And so great job. Let's, let's keep that up. Um, every day, we are going to have these lunch and learn sessions starting today um, from 1215 to 1245. They are optional. I know many of you have other commitments or it's late at night or something like that. But these are truly meant for you to be able to learn a little bit more about Furman. Um, today, there's going to be a student panel. So you'll have the opportunity to hear from some current students at Furman that are engaged in different um, internships or programs within our institutes. Um, throughout the week, there's going to be a session on time management from one of the coaches at Furman. Um, we're also going to have a whole session on internships. Friday, big session, you might want to grab mom and dad or somebody, whoever is kind of your mentor that maybe is helping you with college applications, because Friday we're going to have a session with Melissa Klein from um, the Office of Admissions at Furman, and she's going to help kind of navigate some of all of that craziness of applying for college. So whether you are a freshman or you are getting ready to start that process, I think that'll be a really helpful session for you. Um, these are optional, but I want you to know that um, we're doing this, adding this little piece on to help you grab your lunch, come back, you can sit at your screen um, and eat your lunch. This is the one time we don't mind, or if it's dinner, or if you just need a snack. Um, it is okay for you to sit and listen. Maybe if you are eating, just turn your video off if you don't wanna see everyone. Um, they're only gonna be about 30 minutes, okay? So um, take advantage of it. Today you'll hear from, I think it's three students, um, one from sustainability, one from IECH, and one from innovation and entrepreneurship. So go grab your lunch. If you can't stay, um, that's okay. The last little thing that I wanna say is about resumes for tomorrow, and I'm running over, I know. Um, what, uh, tomorrow to the resume session, bring whatever you have. This is not meant to be that you're gonna have this perfected resume. We are just going to start working on it. Also bring your top five strengths report that you got from Luce. Um, if you don't have that yet, we'll keep working on that. But we're gonna talk about how to frame the language on your resume for a college application or a part-time job, um, kind of do's and don'ts. It's really meant to be helpful to you so that when you leave this um, virtual academy, you're gonna keep working on that, okay? So you're not gonna have your piece of paper and you're gonna be ready to go. Um, it's definitely something I'm always updating my resume or adding things to it or changing language or when something happens, so go for it. All right, I want everyone to have time to grab something to drink or eat or whatever and then meet us back here at 12.15. Um, it's okay if you're a couple minutes late, um, but go for it, okay? And we just got a question from Lily Grace. So if anyone's interested in this, what if you've never done a resume? Um, that's a great question. Susan is going to start at the very beginning. This is yes. something you're going to be working on all during high school to perfect it for when you start applying for jobs and applying for college. Um, I would sit down and think about 
some of the things that you've accomplished in high school, some of the clubs you've been in, and put that on paper. And Susan will help you craft that story to really sell mm -hmm. experiences. Um, yeah. There are some great templates online. So if you Google resume template, you'll get an idea of what you might want to include. You can also Google um, look at, I think Princeton Review has some resources specific for high school students on what your resume might look like for college applications. Um, I'm going to give you a little preview for those of you that are sticking around right now. Um, one of the things that I, and, and I do this with current Furman students, when I have a Furman student ask me to write a letter of recommendation, and I, I know these students really well, but maybe they want a letter of recommendation for medical school or graduate school. I ask them to give me the resume because I may not be familiar with everything that they've done. And so by having that resume, I'm able to kind of go back and look at what I already know about them and look at their resume. And it may remind me about something, especially if I'm writing that letter when they're a rising senior at Furman. I don't necessarily remember what they did when they were freshmen, but if I see it on their resume, it'll, it'll kind of jog my memory and I can be, and if it's something that I knew about or I interacted with them on or that it highlights one of their strengths, um, then I can refer to that in their letter of recommendation. So when you're getting ready to ask for letters of recommendation from teachers, from mentors, um, having a resume that you can provide to them is really helpful because they can be like, oh yeah, I remember um, Tim did this program when he was a sophomore or Caroline um, was a volunteer with this organization and it will jog their memory because for most of us that are working with students, we're working with a lot of students and so um, that's just a really helpful tool. So. And I just got one other question too about what are you supposed to bring tomorrow? So like Susan mentioned, if you have a resume, bring that. If you don't have a resume, I would take a look at some templates online. And like we said, I would at least write down any jobs you may have had, any clubs that you're in, community service. If you've started a business, that needs to be on your resume. Um, and we craft that story. Um, amazing how you can make working at Wendy's an impactful experience. There are so many things that you probably learned from an experience like that, um, whether that's managing people, whether it's leading and being a servant-hearted person. Um, you can really sell that and share the experiences and the skills that you'll bring to the next organization. All right, so we'll get started in about, it looks like eight or nine minutes. So if you guys haven't gone to the bathroom, haven't grabbed something to eat and you need it, feel free to do that now. Get started soon. And yeah, you can just turn off your videos. All righty guys. So we have here with us three students who are, I believe current Furman students um, who have each worked with the different institutes. So we have Katie Wooten from the Institute for the Advancement of Community Health, Robert Swanson, who's worked with innovation, and then Catherine Lippert, who's worked with sustainability. Um, so I have a few questions and we'll get to those, but students feel free to raise your hand if you have a question with the little raise your hand button that we discussed yesterday or to put it in the group chat and we'll make sure to um, ask the panelists those questions. One other thing, if you want kind of a better way to see the panelists, you can go up to the top right corner of your Zoom and hit speaker view. So whoever's talking at that time, it'll only have them on here if you just want to see them, or you can keep it off the gallery view, whatever you would like to do. So panelists, I guess we'll start with you, Katie. Let's see. Can you um, so give us your name, your year at Furman, your major, and where you're from? Sure. Uh, so my name is Katie Wooten. Um, I am a rising senior, and I'm a history major on the pre-law track. Um, and I'm from Norcross, Georgia. Robert? Um, I'm Robert Swanson. I'm a rising junior at Furman and I'm a, a pursuing a business degree at Furman and I'm from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Awesome. And Catherine? Hi, I'm Catherine. I actually just graduated a couple months ago. I was in the class of 2020 
and I was a sustainability science major and I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then can each of you kind of discuss your involvement with the Institute, um, if you were doing an internship or research or whatever that we connected you to, can you speak a little bit more to that? And we'll go through this with the same order, so Katie. Sure, so um, the summer of my sophomore year, I internship with the Medical Legal Partnership um, so that's a collaboration between Furman University, Prisma Health, and um, South Carolina Legal Services. And since I'm on the pre-law track, I was interested more on the legal side of that partnership. Um, so I worked with uh, Katie Buckingham and Kirby Smart, um, and I helped um, interview clients um, to see how we can help them with their legal needs when it comes to healthcare, um, because a lot of the times um, when it comes to your health, um, social factors usually contribute to about 60% of that. So that's where you live. Um, do you live in a healthy um, environment and do you have access to healthcare? So um, through the Medical Legal Partnership, we are able to assist people who didn't have access to the healthcare they needed through um, legal um, help. So. Yeah, um, I'm, in, I'm a student intern with Furman Innovation, and I'm in it right now. So I've been doing it for the summer, and it, it, it goes throughout the summer. So it's been pretty good. Um, I'm just helping run, helping run some social media accounts, um, some other camps, camps they may, may be holding like this one, um, and just among a lot of other tasks like we go through every day. So it's been really good, and uh, I really enjoyed the branching out in the rest of the Furman, Furman family. So, so it's been good. And I'm affiliated with the Shy Institute. And since I've graduated, I was able to interact with them a lot. Um, my freshman year, I worked on the Furman Farm, which is affiliated with the Shy Center. And I learned sustainable farming practices. And then my sophomore year, I lived in the Greenbelt cabins. So I lived with seven other girls and we um, like chose a sustainable lifestyle. And it was a really cool living situation. And that's also affiliated with the Shy Center. Um, and then after my junior year, I interned, I had a Shy Center fellowship. So I interned with the city of Greenville's environmental engineering department. Um, and then now, just like Megan was saying, I'm hired as a post -back fellow and I'm a GIS analyst for the Shy Institute. Awesome, we love our post -backs. Um So what other groups are you guys currently involved with on campus or were you involved with in your case, Catherine? Um, social groups, whatever. I'm involved with the Wesley group on campus, with, which is the United Methodist group. And then I'm also involved with Tri Delta. Um, the group I'm involved in is the basketball team. I'm on the basketball team. So that would be our biggest one, I guess. And I was involved with Mere Christianity Forum, um, the Environmental Action Group and the Bartram Society. And I sing in the Women's Chorale. Nice. Okay, great. So you guys, we have some people who are in all different aspects of um, the university. Furman's got a lot going on, even though we are a small school, we do have a lot of different options for whatever your interest may be. Um, so why did you guys choose Furman? What was the deciding factor for you in your college application process when you were like, this is, this is the one? Um, for me, I really didn't know where I wanted to go. Um, by my junior year of high school. And that's usually when you start at least thinking about it. So I knew I went to a really, really big um, high school. So I was kind of getting tired of the crowds. Um, so I started looking into smaller schools um, and my family had some friends who uh, went and graduated from Furman. So they recommended visiting Furman. Um, so the fall of my junior year, I went to fall for Furman day, which is just a big admissions day where they give lots of tours. Um, and so after that tour, I really considered Furman just because I felt like um, I could really see myself there. Um, and so that's pretty much what I knew. Yeah, mine, my background is actually pretty similar to Katie. I uh, didn't know where I wanted to go till very late in my high school career. And I also went to a pretty big high school. So the smaller college route was attractable to me um so and when i i started uh i'm from south carolina so I was, i've always known about Furman, and 
once the time came, I, I took a visit to Furman and, you know, it was really the one that, that kind of felt, felt like where I could, I could grow the most. So after going there and just keep on, kept on uh, researching it and finding out more and more about it, I kind of just started to think that's where I wanted to go. Um, I'll echo what the other two were saying. I didn't know where I wanted to go until pretty late in the game, to be honest. And I was choosing between Furman and a bigger university right in my hometown. And I ultimately just decided that a smaller college was really important to me, as was the liberal arts curriculum, because I wanted a more well-rounded education instead of just being like funneled right into my major. So I really appreciated that um, well-rounded curriculum that we have at Furman. So yeah, I really liked the small class sizes. I feel like the professors, I'd be able to gain really strong relationships with them since the class sizes are smaller. Um, and then I would get a great education here. Cool. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Furman and you know our mission, we do have something called um, the Furman Advantage, which is that we really emphasize having experiences on campus and within our community that can help you figure out what you do want to do what you don't want to do and that could be through research internships study away programs um, we really encourage students to get involved with all of those different things so that once you graduate from firm and you have a better idea of just where where you're headed within your life and your career um, so to each of you are there any besides the internships or experiences that you had with the institute were there any other really impactful experiences that you've had that you think has really kind of shaped your vocational story? Um, for me, the summer of my freshman year, um, I started researching with the history department. Um, and I'm actually continuing that research this summer. So it's kind of followed me throughout my Furman career. Um, so through that experience, I realized how I really enjoyed research, which got me thinking um, to go to law school. Um, so that really shaped my um, decisions and career decisions overall. I also, this past fall, before the world shut down, I went to Edinburgh for the semester, which was a fantastic experience, just um, traveling and learning outside of the States and just getting a broader worldview. Uh, for me, last summer, the the basketball team we went to the Bahamas to you know help help some of the kids down there with and family families in need down there. So uh, doing that and just teaching them teaching them some basketball stuff along with along with a lot of life skills was really really impactful to me. Um, just going outside of the states, like uh, Katie said, and just sharing what the Furman Furman knowledge is and what we're all about. So that was, that was really impactful for me. Um, mine are very similar to Katie's and Robert's. Um, after my sophomore year, I did research with the psychology department and that really beefed up my quantitative analysis skills, which has served me well for my current job that I'm in. And then um, the second semester of my junior year, I studied abroad in South Africa, Botswana and Namibia. And that was like the best experience of my life. Like we were camping in the bush and went to a bunch of different countries and it was amazing. So that definitely changed my life and was like one of the highlights of my Furman experience. Yeah, I think it's a lot of students really take advantage of that study away. And to all of you high school students, if you're not sure about it, I would encourage you to look into that, whatever institute that you end up going to, because it really is a transformative experience and gets you outside of your your university community, but also outside of the United States and really just changes your worldview. Um, I spent my junior year fall semester in um, Spain, speaking the language there and just learning about their culture. So something I would highly recommend if you're looking into that. Um, one of the students asked, how did you guys decide on a career that you wanted to follow? And has that changed in your years at Furman? I'm sure it has, it changed for me at least. <laughs> Um, I went into Furman having absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and like Catherine said, that was one of the reasons I decided to go to Furman, just because I knew I would get the support I needed to help me decide that big um, decision. So part of the reason I got into research um, my first summer as a Furman student was that one of my professors realized that I had no plans for the summer. So she's like, well, you can just help me um, with my research this summer um, just because I had her in a class and um, 
she um, could see me doing and liking the history research. Um, and so from that, like I said, I realized that I really enjoyed the research process, um, which got me thinking into law. So yeah, just, just the mentors that Furman provides from the professors um, really helps you decide and you really don't have to know going in the first day you're a Furman student. You can just take your time and take classes that you enjoy. Yeah, for me, I, I when I first got to Furman, I really had no clue what I wanted to do. But uh, I was over time. Over uh, over time, I came pretty intrigued with the business business major at Furman, and um, Furman then like kind of set me up with a few mentors, like Katie said, and uh, that were that were of that um, major. So I got to talk to them and just learn from them what what it was all about. And after after those experiences, you know, I kind of decided that's what I wanted to do. I, again, am very similar to the other two. Um, and Valentina, I'll answer your question here. She asked, do, do you have to major in psychology to do research there? And um, sometimes if you're interested, a professor will just allow you to do research with them, even if you're not a declared major. But for me, I was a declared psychology major for my first two years at Furman. And then through a variety of experiences and classes I took, um, I thought maybe sustainability science would be better suited towards my interests. Um, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And to be honest, I still don't know what I want to do. And that's totally okay. Like right now I'm in my first job and it'll last for a year or two. And then I may go to grad school or may do something else. So I think a lot of people put some pressure on you to figure out exactly what you want to do from the beginning. But I mean, honestly, everyone's path has a lot of twists and turns. And if you just keep kind of following your interests, things typically fall into place, you know? Yeah, for sure. I see someone here asked, do you have to be ready to declare your major, you know, day one at Furman? Um, definitely not. Um, you have until, I believe, the end of your sophomore year at Furman to, to declare your major. Um, other universities do ask that you uh, um, apply to a certain major or a certain school within their university, but not at Furman. Um, and that's kind of the great thing that you really have those two years to explore different options that may be available to you. Um, and I mean, like Catherine was saying, you're interests change, your career path changes. I'm with her. You know, I've been on this post back track for two years and we're still figuring it out every day. So don't feel like you need to go into college and day one be like, I know exactly what my life's going to look like for the next 20 years because that's just nuts. Um, let's see. We have a question about the business major for you, Robert. Um, what's the, the business major like and what do you plan to use it for? Um, the business major, the main thing about it is the uh, the business block, which is which is like one semester you have to go through where it's four classes that they, they kind of set up for you. And I'll be taking that next semester. So haven't done that yet. And uh, what I plan to do with that is, you know, just see where it takes me. Um, I really don't have any specific uh, thing that I want to go into through business, but I'm sure that over these classes that I, that I get to take there, it'll kind of help me see where I want to go and see what I want to do with that. And then for you, Catherine, there is a question asking, would it be beneficial to double major in sustainability and environmental science? I'm not sure. And um, as Hannah put in the chat, there will be some advisors within the sustainability track to talk to, but I actually don't know of anyone who has done that. And I think they discourage that because there's a lot of overlap between the courses. So I'm not even actually sure if that's possible because it may not count towards it. Um, more common double majors with sustainability or environmental science are like economics or um, something like that to give you a more broad skill set to take into either one of those majors. So I don't think it's common at all and probably not very beneficial to double major in both of those because there's significant overlap already. And to answer Corey's question, can you double major or would you, or you know people, I knew a bunch of people who double majored, I was a double major kind of depends on what your interests are you know what classes do you have you come in with that you can have time within your schedule to double major so for instance I knew that I really wanted to study abroad in Spain I had been you know learning Spanish since I was four so that was already an interest that I had and it really paired well with my psychology major to have that double um, that's a discussion you can have with your advisors once you're here of you know given the time frame that you have do you want a double major you could have a a major and a minor, you could have a major and I believe we have a bunch of concentrations. So it's really um, whatever you're interested in and what, and what works best for you. Let's see. 
So I guess for each of you, do you plan to go to graduate school? I know some of you are in jobs. Do you plan to go to straight into graduate school or maybe take a few years of the gap year? Or do you even know? Because it's great if you don't know. I didn't know when I was a junior, so I'll tell you that. Um, as of right now, I am planning on going to law school once I graduate. Um, so I'm actually graduating a semester early, so that means I'll be graduating in December. Mm -hmm. um, so I will work um, starting January through August, so when um, law school starts. So that's the plan right now. Who knows? <laughs> Lots of unknowns um, to get to that point, but that's my plan. For me, uh, I'm not totally sure as of right now because I have two more years of, of school left. So maybe when the time comes, I might, but I'm not dead set on, on, it, on that yet, so. And I'm right now working full time and this position um, lasts one year and it can be renewed one time. So I might be here for a year or two. And then after that, I'm super open to going to grad school, but I'm also super open to pursuing another full time job. So I think it just depends on what opportunities arise and hopefully I discern that a little bit more in the coming year or two. So I'll keep you posted. Yeah. So Megan, why don't you share what you're doing, Megan? Yeah, so I mean, like all everyone said, it's a really organic process and it really is an individual decision. Um, a lot of people come in thinking, everyone goes to grad school or everyone has the same plan and that's just not true. It really depends on what's best for you. Um, I went into my senior year at Furman knowing that I didn't wanna go directly into a graduate program. Um, I just wasn't ready to make that kind of commitment because graduate programs are a lot more specific than an undergraduate program and I wasn't there yet. Um, so I actually, I went to a networking event in the fall of my um, senior year, met some people from AmeriCorps uh, and actually ended up applying to an AmeriCorps program at the end of my senior year and spent a year doing a service year up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which I had never been there before. I'm originally from North Carolina, so it was a totally different world. Um, but, you know, spent nine to five serving in a clinic up there. And that was super eye-opening um, just to see a totally different world than I've, than I've ever experienced before. Um, after that year, I applied to a job as a post-baccalaureate fellow with the Institute for the Advancement of Community Health. I've been here for two years in a full-time position, so working full-time, um, helping them with honestly a bunch of different stuff. It's been a great position because I've gotten to kind of tip my toes into different types of pr um, projects. So I've done evaluation of health related initiatives in the area. I've done program management. I've worked with undergraduate students. Uh, I've done some event planning, you know, <laughs> just a bunch of different stuff, um, which has been great to, to kind of figure out more of what I'm looking for. Um, and it worked after three years. I'm going back to school, I'm happy to say. So I'll be pursuing uh, an MBA next month. I'll start that program at Brandeis. So, I mean, it's, it really changes. I would not put pressure on yourself to have your career figured out at 18. I certainly did not. No one here who's a firm and alum or, you know, has been through the college experience. No one's path is linear and I cannot emphasize that enough. Hey, I have a question that might be helpful too. Yeah. Maybe the panelists can answer. What are things that these students in high school can be doing now, maybe to explore different areas? Or what was something that was helpful for you to kind of figure that out before you got to college? Do any of our panelists have any sage advice on that, on what people can do now? I would say just to try to get as much knowledge as you can on each each of these schools that you might be interested in. And because uh, there is, I know there is a lot and there might be a lot you're interested in. So just just weigh in your options and see what what could be beneficial for you at each school and just really really taking all that into account before you make any decisions and i think going into that it's not just your academics or your major it's like the opportunity to do undergraduate research which a bunch of us have pursued but that is not very common at other schools like this is a very heavy research undergraduate institution so that may not be possible at other schools. Um, similarly, study abroad, like Furman makes it really, really easy to study abroad, whether that's like from scheduling or from your scholarships and financial aid perspective. Um, and that is fairly unique as well. So 
not only like when you're considering colleges, think about the major, the class size or whatever, but also think about like, how well do they set me up to do research or internships or study away or whatever you think is important to you outside of the classroom. Great, thanks for sharing. A few more minutes left. Do you have any, for all three of you, do you have any advice for these students about what to be looking for as they look into different types of institutes, things that they should really, really be considering before they start applying, like size, location, any advice on that? Um, I would say um, definitely go on as many tours as possible um, and keep your options open. Thinking back to when I was looking at schools, I remember that I was considering doing genetics as a career. And now I laugh because that's so different than what I'm doing now. So just keep your options open because of course your mind may change. You may consider law instead of genetics. Um, and you know, when you are considering between schools, just think back to whether or not you felt like you could call um, the institution, the university home. Not only um, if you felt like you could see yourself, you know, social life there, but also academics and especially um, what the university university could do um, in the future. So alumni connections and networking, I think is a really important thing as well. Yeah, something I would say is just I, like I did, I just they, just take your time when you're deciding because um, like Katie said, your mind might always change and might change every week for that matter. So just take your time when deciding and don't feel like you need to rush that rush that uh, decision. And kind of to add on to what Robert was saying, um, just like with your career, like you may not know what you're gonna do. And some people say like, oh, when I went to this college, I felt like this perfect feeling that this was like my home. I'm gonna be honest, I never felt that at any school I ever toured. Um, and I didn't even really feel that when I got accepted into Furman and went there. It took a couple of months for me to get adjusted and really love it. And now it's like, literally feels like my home. Whenever I go back, I drive in, I'm like, oh, it's my home. But that took so long to feel that, like halfway through freshman year. So if you don't get like that magical feeling, that's totally okay too. And like, not everybody feels that. Can somebody, yeah, the question about um, academic rigor. Um, we've had that question a couple times. Can you guys talk about academic rigor a little bit at Furman and maybe how many hours you spent studying? Um, I would say it's pretty rigorous, um, at least for me it was, <laughs> um, but I, freshman year, you really learn how to better manage your time and how to really study. Um, so what advice someone gave me in my fresh, freshman year was to treat um, your, your classes and your study time as a full-time job if you can. Um, so what really helped me, especially my first year, is just acting like, okay, I'm gonna work from nine to five. Um, and then from there, you can just take the rest of the day off and relax, because it's also really important to make sure you give yourself breaks. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I would say it def is rigorous for me as well. Um, but you know, at, as, I, as you go along, it, it kinda, you kind of figure it out and figure out what works for you and uh, how long you might need to study every day. So it, it is rigorous, but you can you can get through it. it. You can always get through it as you go along. I would also say that it's rigorous, um, but it's also so interesting. Like I've taken so many classes that I didn't mind studying for because it was interesting to me. And then also professors are so willing to meet with you and there are so many good free resources. So there's like free tutoring, there's people to help you write your papers if you need someone to look over and edit it. Professors are almost always willing to meet with you outside of class and help you if you need help. So while it is rigorous, there are great support systems, um, both right, right from your class, but also just across the university that can help with that as well. Catherine, can you answer kind of to Daisy's question as well? Like, did you have study groups? You mentioned tutors that were available, but what did studying look like with other people? Um, I think, 
you know, some study groups come organically from classes. Like some classes I've been will make a group me with everybody in it and they'll be like, okay, let's go study here or whatever. Um, sometimes the professor will organize it, especially before exams, but typically that's kind of on you to meet with people that are in your class and come up with that. But a lot of classes have TAs as well and TAs might be willing to help out with a study group or something. So, but that kind of is more student led. A TA is a teaching assistant for those of you who don't know who that is. And that's usually um, in like a junior or senior in your area. And then someone asked, are the institutions places where you can take classes? Do you commit to work with one or can you explore several? Um, so I don't believe any of the institutions have actual classes that are through the institutions. Susan, do you want to chime in on that? So um, the Shy Institute and IACH, because we do have faculty um, that are part of our institutes, there are classes that we are part of. Um, and by that, I mean, there are courses that directly relate to the work that's going on in Shy with a sustainability major. And then within IACH, um, we have some AX courses that we sponsor and or co-teach um, around things like medical Spanish, the medical legal partnership, um, the emergency medicine department as a microcosm of society. So those are courses that are affiliated with our institutes, but they're not, um, we are not academic departments. Um, and so we don't function like academic departments, but we are involved in that. Um, you can explore all the institutes and there is another institute um, they didn't participate in um, this summer but the Riley Institute I think um, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of Riley Institute if you're familiar with Furman they um, have some work in education and policy um, but you are more than welcome to explore working with all four institutes um, and the other thing I would say is that we collaborate together and so you may be doing something in sustainability around um, food insecurity, and that may um, then kind of bridge into a project that IACH is doing, as I mentioned earlier, about social determinants of health. And so there's going to be a lot of collaboration there. We collaborate around um, research as well. Um, we had a project a couple of years ago around transportation here in Greenville. Um, we do a lot with GIS mapping with Shy. So there are lots of opportunities to collaborate with all of the institutes. Um, and I think it is um, my last little plug for the institutes. The advantage to our outfacing institutes is, is that we are not academic departments, right? And so we have people working in each institute who have worked in these fields. And so you get actual professional mentors. Um, they may also be teaching or they might be a faculty member, but they have that additional component of having that world experience of working in that field or being able to bring you a vocational story that maybe looks different from a traditional faculty member. So yes, engage with all of us. Um, that was a long answer, but I wanted to be sure to get that all in. And to kind of go off of that, you know, the, the institutes are kind of your like link to all of these community resources that we have because we do complete projects and work on projects with community partners in the area. So if you're interested in an internship or research with, you know, the health system or with a certain business or something like that, the institutes can really help facilitate that relationship. Um, let's see, we have some questions about campus life at Furman and kind of how do you balance you know, making sure that you're, you're doing your schoolwork and getting that completed and also ha having fun. Um, what I would say is you kind of have to find the right balance between both because if you know if you put all your time into school you become pretty stressed is what I find, found out. But uh, if you also put your time into other things, you might not do as well in some areas you would want to. So just find out what the balance looks like for you. And uh, you can definitely find that out as time goes along and as you, as you go through classes and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I think um, balance is key, but also having grace with yourself. Um, I mean, Furman is difficult, so it's important to give yourself grace for academics, but also like the transition to college is difficult for some people. So like giving yourself grace in terms of like your social life or finding friends is also important. So um, I think you'll figure it out, but if you know if something isn't going well, you just gotta make adjustments. Um, so if you feel like you're falling behind, like definitely take some time to go to the tutoring resources before you fall further behind and then maybe evaluate how you're spending your time and what you're involved in. Yeah, that's a really good point. And to add to that, I think um, I really struggled freshman year just with the rigor and really having to learn how to um, study and actually, you know, learn instead of just memorize. Um, but I think it's also really important to know, like, you're going to make mistakes. So like Catherine said, just give, you, give yourself grace. And also just try not to compare yourself to others. Um, Berman can be competitive, um, whether it's academics or just, um, you know, sports or whatever. So just know that, you know, you're, you're not going to be perfect and don't feel the need to compare yourself um, when you do mess up. Okay. Are there any other last real burning questions? I know we're a little bit over time and I'm sure you all are tired from looking at your screens all day. Um, and if you don't have any now or you don't feel comfortable asking them here, put them in the chat and we will send them to the panel and they will respond to them later. All right. So I think we're good. Um, yeah, if you guys don't have any other questions, we will see you at 9 a.m. or a little before tomorrow morning to kick off with our next sessions. Day uh, two. But thank you to our panelists for taking the time to, to talk with us and to answer all of their questions. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you guys very much. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a good afternoon.